briefly, presiding officer, Scotland is the place to be, and Scotland is the place where people have been. <laughs> Many thanks. And we now move on to the next item of business, which is a statement by Angela Constance on working together progressive workplace policies in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement, and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. I now call on Angela Constance. Ms Constance, please make your statement. Thank you, President Officer. Over the course of the last two years, there has been a clear and sustained strengthening in the Scottish economy. In the first quarter of this year, the economy moved back above pre-recession levels. And today's labour market statistics show that our recovery is continuing uh, to gain momentum. Unemployment is down and employment is at its highest level ever. Female employment continues to increase and now sits at the highest level since records began. And whilst the female unemployment rate is at its lowest since May to July 2009. Youth employment has increased and fewer young people are now unemployed in Scotland compared to a year ago. And whilst I welcome the drop in youth unemployment that today's figures show, it is so important that all of our young people have the chance to get a foothold in the labour market and we want to see the unemployment figure uh, continue to decrease. The aim of the Scottish Government is to do better than simply return to pre-recession levels of economic performance. Even in the supposed good times before the recession, Scotland had a youth unemployment rate of 13.2% and the UK had a rate of 14.3%. And that compares to just 5.9% in the Netherlands, 7.4% in Norway and 7.5% in Denmark. So we can and must do better. It will take time, but building a labour market and economy that is resilient, adaptable and responsive to change will be key to ensuring that Scotland's businesses compete internationally, delivering long-term prosperity and high-quality jobs. We need to ensure that we support the type of growth that reduces inequalities and helps everyone, not just those closest to the labour market, to realise their potential. We need the type of growth that reduces disparities between different parts of Scotland. And we need the type of growth that is sustainable and resilient and which focuses on maximising returns from work. And through existing devolved powers, the Scottish Government has taken forward a range of ambitious initiatives, including opportunities for all, investment in childcare, sustained investment and reform in education, record numbers of modern apprenticeships and programmes such as Community Jobs Scotland and the Youth Employment Scotland Fund to meet the challenges that we face. We will, of course, do more, presiding officer. For example, by implementing the recommendations of the Young Workforce Commission, we will deliver world-class vocational education and training to support sustainable employment and to boost productivity. And I announced four and a half million pounds of funding and an early response to the recommendations. And we share the Commission's aspirations to reduce youth unemployment by 40% by 2020. Scotland's economy will only achieve its full potential when we maximise the quality as well as the quantity of work, offering equality of opportunity to grow our skills, to apply those skills and to boost business productivity and we need to embed progressive workplace policies. And as such, presiding officer, I therefore welcome the publication of the report of the Working Together Review. I am grateful to all the members, Chris Parr, Mary Grant, Sue Bruce, Mary Alexander, Lillian Maser, Graham Smith, Professor Patricia Finlay, and I'm particularly, particularly grateful to the Review Group's Chair, uh, Jim Mather. They were asked to review progressive workplace policies in the public and private sectors, identify opportunities for innovation which would enhance productivity, highlight good practice and recommend how we build on that to optimise the relationships that link trade unions, employers and government. And as expected, their report is substantive. And in the recommendation section it says, and I, I quote directly, presiding officer, 
Our report provides a great deal of evidence which confirms that many unions, employers and employees are already reaping the benefits of working together to construct their own business or sector specific models of modern cooperative industrial relations. And we welcome that and recognise that it is one of Scotland's existing economic strengths and we are ambitious to build on that success. Presiding officer, I fully endorse that statement. The Scottish Government uh, regards trade unions as key social partners, playing an important role in sustaining effective democracy in society, particularly at the workplace, and sees the existence of good employment practices as a key contributor to economic competitiveness and social justice. And while some may not share that view, engaging and empowering employees is widely recognised as a key success factor. And the report challenges businesses and employers, trade unions, members and officials and government to learn, to adapt and to evolve. It identifies four action priorities, building capacity, ongoing dialogue, real partnership opportunities and a willingness to learn from what works. And the Scottish Government will of course consider the report and the recommendations fully, engaging directly with business and trade unions and prepare a formal response. And today I want to highlight elements of the report which resonate with Scotland's future and the jobs plan for an independent Scotland which was published yesterday. We want Scotland to be an innovative, high wage and high productivity economy that competes in international markets and focuses on high value goods and services. Independence will provide greater opportunities to build a new economic framework that better utilises our unique strengths and which delivers a more outward focused and resilient economy. Under independence, the Scottish Government would have greater access to levers to support the labour market. And I am pleased that the Working Together review, while adopting a neutral position on the referendum, and rightly so, has endorsed a fair employment framework in Recommendation 11, and I welcome the proposed focus on supporting and encouraging uh, diversity in all its forms in the workplace and particularly uh, for women and young people. And I endorse the importance of capturing and applying evidence of what really works and promoting an ongoing dialogue at workplace, sectoral and national levels uh, as detailed in recommendations 19 and 20. The independent body proposed by the review to lead joint work uh, by unions, employers and government which boosts productivity and sustainable economic growth uh, adds weight, in my view, to our plans for a Fair Work Commission and a linked National Convention on Employment and Labour Relations. Adopting an inclusive, innovative and holistic approach will promote change for the better and stronger social partnerships uh, will drive that forward. Progressive workplace policies can help improve firms' productivity and innovation and aid sustainable growth. Well-rewarded and sustained employment is the best route out of poverty and the best way to tackle inequality. And that is what I want uh, for Scotland's future. Presiding officer, can I conclude by reiterating that the Scottish Government is uh, most certainly for trade unions because of all that they have contributed uh, to workplaces, to communities across Scotland, to wider civic society and indeed to innovation, productivity and economic growth. And the Scottish Government is most certainly for businesses because they deliver jobs and the economic growth that underpins uh, opportunities for all. And we are most certainly for fair work and good employment practices and indeed, presiding officer, we are most certainly for independence. Many thanks. And the Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement. And I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions and it would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question were to press the request to speak buttons now and question one is from Jenny Mana. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of her statement. I'd also like to thank our colleagues in the trade unions and in industry for their work on this report. I think, presiding officer, the employment figures today are to be welcomed. They show that economic growth is steady as part of the United Kingdom, but we all across this chamber want to do better. And I commend the Cabinet Secretary's ambition to deliver world-class vocational education. And as before, 
well, I welcome the £4.5 million funding, but I wonder when the detail of how that money will be spent will be available for us to scrutinise. But as Labour said in response to the publication of the Wood Commission, it is very difficult for us, presiding officer, to square the government's laudable words on vocational education with their funding priorities to date. Colleges have had a very raw deal from the Scottish Government with 140,000 fewer students going to college since 2007 and 80,000 of them being women. And I would like to repeat to the Cabinet Secretary that a reduction target of youth unemployment of 40% by 2020 is far too modest. Our Government should have much higher targets for the scourge of youth unemployment. But the 40% target, Cabinet Secretary, how does this square with John Swinney's announcement this weekend that there will be full employment in an independent Scotland? I'm confused as to why she is announcing a target of re reducing youth unemployment by 40% in her independent Scotland when John Swinney has found jobs for 100% of our question young people is... in an independent Scotland. On this very vital issue, jobs for our young people, what is the government's real target? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. I was half expecting a question from Ms Mara uh, on the Government's response to the Working Together review. I appreciate the Government has only had the Working Together review for a few days now, but it is nonetheless a very significant report that has been the result of six months' work. It's a 70-page document that has made 30 very far-reaching uh, recommendations. And with regards to the £4.5 million um, that I announced to make early progress uh, with regards to the Young Workforce Commission, of course, details of that was available some time ago, and much of that money was to go on foundation apprenticeships, tackling occupational segregation, supporting Education Scotland in their new, new roles uh, and such like. If, of course, she wishes further detail uh, and she wishes to ask detailed questions, we can indeed uh, supply that information to her. And in terms of her swipe, uh, against the college system in Scotland. Can I just remind her, before answering the substantive question about full employment, that we are indeed investing more in further education than any other uh, previous administration, and we now have a funding for it. And it's also worth remembering that women aren't underrepresented uh, in further uh, education and that additional funding uh, was supplied of uh, £6 million for additional part-time places, very much focused on uh, women uh, returners to the labour market. And let me just be clear for the record, presiding officer, what I've campaigned for and what I've believed in in all my life uh, is indeed full employment. And what I want to see in this parliament is a parliament with job-creating job powers uh, which will see that full employment. And in terms of the recommendation, the 40% recommendation reduction uh, in youth unemployment uh, by 2020, I always thought the Labour Party over the past two years had been calling uh, for targets. And if I can remind her that that target came from the Young Workforce Commission and the target was to get move us from being in the top 10 economies when it comes to young people to being amongst uh, the top five uh, economies. But I hope that we have un un unanimity uh, in this chamber that we all support uh, full employment. Employment. And I would contend that we've got far greater prospects of achieving uh, full employment in this country uh, with a parliament with full job creating powers. Thank you. Fraser. Uh, thank you. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of her statement and commend the uh, members of the review group for their work. I think all of us support the aim of improving industrial relations, although it's fair to say that uh, with a few high profile uh, exceptions, we in Scotland generally have a good record uh, in this area in recent years. Uh, I do think it is disappointing that the Cabinet Secretary chose to uh, use her announcement to seek to further the case for independence, perhaps not surprising at this point, but it would have been better, I think, if she just tried to build some consensus. I have uh, three brief questions, if I may, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Firstly, the uh, review proposes the establishment of a new independent body to lead joint work by unions, employers uh, and governments why, while this may have some merit, do we really need uh, another quango to take this forward? Secondly, uh, Recommendation 21 of the review group asks the Scottish Government to use procurement rules to promote a living wage. I thought we'd had that debate during the procurement bill. I thought the Scottish Government had told us it wouldn't be legal to do that. I wonder why nobody seems to have told the review group. Uh, and thirdly, Recommendation 24 asks the Scottish Government to legislate to ensure worker representation on all public sector bodies, boards. Uh, if the Scottish Government is going to look at that, can I suggest that they also look at the question of representation on such boards 
of consumers or service users. Thank you, presiding officer. Of course, it will come as no surprise to Mr Fraser that I am and this government is a proponent um, of independence. And I think it is nonetheless very interesting that he is um, trying, he says, or he articulates to seek consensus because we in this government very much uh, believe in social partnership. We very much believe and pay tribute and credit uh, to the trade mo union movement uh, who have made a massive uh, contribution uh, to the economy in this country as well as wider uh, civic gains. And I think you can contrast um, our approach uh, to social partnership and industrial relations uh, very positively uh, to that of the UK government. Um, where uh, the CAR uh, report uh, seems to have uh, stumbled and failed and now uh, will make a much uh, uh, briefer report and will actually make no recommendations. Uh, interestingly uh, enough, because it talks about the very febrile uh, atmosphere in the lead up to the general election, and it is interesting that despite um, us all being engaged in the most historic campaign and election and vote leading up to September the 18th, that nonetheless uh, this government and this country have been able to support uh, a body of work that is about you know, finding a consensus and a way forward and building real, lasting and meaningful social partnership in this country, uh, which has to involve uh, trade unions, but it also has to uh, involve uh, employers. And I think we can stand uh, proud uh, by our record. Um, I am very sympathetic to the creation of a stakeholder body. Um, I do not see it as another quango. I do see it as an essential forum uh, to create a win-win situation, uh, both for employers and workers, uh, the length and breadth um, of this, this, this country. And if you believe in social justice and sustainable economic growth, you have to uh, see social partnership and the bodies and the dialogue um, and the ongoing uh, dialogue and working together uh, as part um, of that vision. Um, in terms of procurement, uh, in terms of recommendation uh, 21, I'm sure Mr Fraser um, is aware um, that um, as a result of the procurement reform bill um, we are now in a position where we are consulting on the statutory guidance uh, and I think the statutory guidance part of the procurement bill is very much um, indeed welcome and that gives uh, an opportunity that is part of the procurement process that we can consider uh, some wider workforce issues in terms of people's terms and conditions and indeed um, that, that their pay and that's very important um, in terms of uh, standards of living uh, for people who are struggling uh, with the rising cost uh, of living and it's very important uh, and to the benefit of our economy and indeed business. And my final uh, comment, presiding officer, is um, I met, um, I've met many uh, very progressive employers on my travels uh, in this portfolio and previous uh, portfolios and most employers recognise the importance of progressive workplace policies uh, and their importance uh, to, to their business and the success of their business. Many thanks. Now, there are many members seeking to ask questions this afternoon, so succinct questions and answers would be welcome, please. Annabel Ewing. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that in the wake of the banking crash, Westminster froze the minimum wage, forcing some of Scotland's hardest pressed families to bear the burden of Westminster's economic mismanagement. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that any future independent Scottish Government of which she is a part will ensure that the minimum wage always keeps pace with inflation. That's it. Uh, yes, presiding officer, um, ensuring that the minimum wage um, is uprated by uh, RPI and keeps a pace uh, with the cost of living would be a key uh, priority and indeed a key plank of the work taken forward uh, by a, a Fair Work Commission. I think it is of note uh, that come uh, this October there will be 150,000 people uh, in Scotland uh, on the living wage. 100,000 of those uh, are women and if, uh, if the minimum wage had kept pace uh, with the cost of living, uh, those 100,000 women would certainly be uh, nearly £700 uh, better off. But I see uh, fair pay um, as a mark of a, a civic society and something uh, which we could build and make a lot of progress on. Many thanks. Ian Gray. Uh, Minister said in her statement, Scotland's economy will only achieve its full potential when we maximise the quality as well as the quantity of work. And, you know, I can only agree with those fine words, but Murdoch Fraser is right. We could have taken a real step in that direction by guaranteeing, not guiding, but guaranteeing a living wage and banning zero-hour contracts for all workers on publicly funded contracts. Why on earth would the Minister and her colleagues not work together with us and the trade unions to make that happen? 
Cabinet Secretary. Mr. Officer, I do think it's um, unfortunate that Mr Gray seems to have a short memory because my recollection was that Mr Gray um, and uh, trade union uh, colleagues to us all worked very closely with the government and while there was indeed uh, a disagreement as to what was and was not possible uh, under um, EU uh, le legislation, I think considerable progress uh, was made under the, the procurement uh, legislation and in the fact that the uh, amendments uh, proposed by the Deputy First Minister uh, included uh, the, the living wage and we do of course uh, all live with the difficulty of the fact that we have a national minimum wage enforceable in law which is much lower uh, to the living wage which is not enforceable by law. And I think there's been very clear uh, guidance from that from uh, Commissioner uh, Barnier. But it is a shame that we can't recognise uh, where progress has been made. Procurement has to be used as a power of good and to improve the, the working conditions uh, for people, uh, the length and breadth of this country. Um, the debate you know, has moved forward. We will always look to see what more we can do. And the consultation on the statutory guidance just now is very important. Many thanks. Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, President Officer. In the report by the Jim Reid Foundation, Working Together, a vision for industrial democracy and a commonweal economy tells us that the country with the strongest worker participation rate, according to the EU participation index, is Denmark. The high levels of worker participation in Denmark can be attributed to three factors. The strength of trade unions' rights and collective bargaining agreements, the cooperation of committees of employers and employees, and worker participation on management boards. Along with the measures outlined in today's report, can the Cabinet Secretary reassure me and the workers of an independent Scotland that this Commonweal approach will be looked at very closely as a possible model for the highest standards of employee-employer relations. Of your patience and uh, brevity, presiding officer, can I just concur, um, you know, with the tone and tenor as to uh, Miss McKelvey's uh, question? And actually, when people get a chance to read the report in depth, they will see for themselves the evidence, not just internationally but across Scotland, uh, that speaks to the strength um, of, you know, things like collective bargaining and partnership working. Thanks, Drew Smith. Uh, thank you, President Officer. As a former board member of Scottish Union Learning, I'm particularly interested and thankful for uh, the review group's recommendations in relation to workplace learning. And union learning is a great example of how trade unions do add value to work in Scotland, but industrial relations, of course, require two to tango, and there are good employers in Scotland and less interested uh, employers. Your Why does the Cabinet is... Secretary believe that business in Scotland will be more likely to support workplace learning after independence? And if it isn't automatic, what specific uh, steps would she intend to encourage engagement from business to meet their skills obligations? Cabinet Secretary. Sorry, officer, Mr Smith is right to say that there is nothing inevitable about the relationships and the conduct between peoples and uh, interested uh, parties. But it is important, I think, to recognise um, the considerable achievements, not just of the, of the trade union movement, uh, but of you know, employers the length and breadth of Scotland. And I believe uh, firmly from consulting with you know, a whole host of stakeholders that there's a real appetite in Scotland for a social partnership framework and to take things uh, forward. I'm very pleased that he's shown an interest uh, in Scottish Union Learning. I have a particular portfolio uh, responsibility for that. Uh, uh, Scottish Union Learning uh, has certainly thrived uh, under the, this government and we remain very committed to it. Thank you very much. Willie Coffey. Thank you. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, in an independent Scotland, will the Scottish Government give a commitment to ending current UK employment practices which see people, particularly young people, exploited due to low wages and poor conditions of service? Can I say? I regret very much that employment law uh, remains reserved to the UK and I know that Willie Coffey has written to me um, about the experiences of one of his uh, young constituents. It was an experience that was certainly very similar to a young constituent uh, of mine where they were uh, very subject to exploitative practices and extremely uh, poor pay. And although you know, employment law is currently not reserved uh, to, to this place, there was certainly uh, action I undertook with Skills Development Scotland to ensure um, that young people could have access uh, to better employment advice and on that regard I also have to uh, pay uh, tribute uh, to the STUC Youth Committee uh, and all the work that they have done uh, in this regard and my final point uh, presiding officer is that I think uh, fair work uh, for all irrespective of age will be a key plank of the work taken forward by a fair work commission. Many thanks. Jim Hume. 
Thank you. Recommendation uh, 24 uh, recommends to keep in mind in particular the need to increase the number of women on our public sector boards. I, of course, wholeheartedly agree with that. But given that, can the Cabinet Secretary explain why the nominations to the Scottish Government's Fiscal Commission do not support the policy that women should make up 40 per cent of the membership of public boards? Uh, well, Mr Hume, this government is certainly uh, leading by example um, and has 40% uh, of Cabinet uh, with female representation. And I, would, you know, I think it would be fair to say uh, that Cabinet is indeed Scotland's uh, company board. And I'm glad to see that the UK government uh, followed suit um, and uh, have followed where we have led and have increased the number of women uh, that are in the, the UK government at a very uh, senior level. With regards to uh, recommendation 24, and I have to uh, apologise, I actually uh, didn't answer part of Murdo uh, Fraser's question in relation to recommendation uh, 24, and I'll sweep that up now, uh, presiding officer, in my uh, reply to, to Jim Hume. Uh, the recommendation uh, in 24 is that the government should legislate to ensure that there is effective worker representation from representative trade unions on the board of every public sector body. We will certainly be uh, taking a close look at that recommendation, taking it seriously and investigating it because it chimes very clearly uh, with our aspirations and plans to increase the representation of women on boards uh, in Scotland and we have laid out our intentions and if necessary um, our uh, ability and desire to legislate should we be required to do so. Thanks very much. Christian Allard. The UK Government's austerity policies and welfare cuts are hitting women the hardest. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that by increasing the participation of women in the workplace and reducing the gender pay gap that exists in some professions, Scotland could see clear economic benefits? So, you know, so I think the Joseph Rowntree Foundation uh, and indeed this uh, Working Together review report made uh, a very uh, salient point about uh, inequality. We often, when we're discussing and debating inequality, talk about it in terms of uh, welfare reform or cuts uh, or tax policies, uh, rightly so. But we mustn't forget to say uh, that well-rewarded, high-quality work is actually uh, the best route out of poverty. Many thanks. I call on Ken McIntosh now, please. Thank you. Can I thank the Minister uh, for her statement and for the direction of travel she has indicated in a, uh, a pro progressive and sustainable employment. The concept of decent work is one that we can unite around, although I would observe it stands in uh, contrast to the government's support that she gives to uh, union avoiding and tax avoiding companies like Amazon. Sorry, President Officer. Uh, can I ask the Minister whether she will uh, introduce progressive policies supported by Labour, such as wage ratios, minimising the salary differentials between the highest and lowest paid? So, you know, so I'll look at the detail of any recommendations that uh, Ken McIntosh uh, wishes to uh, forward me and perhaps on uh, the note of consensus um, I'll just unite with Mr McIntosh and say that I agree that everybody uh, uh, should uh, pay their tax and that sometimes tax enforcement uh, is as much of an issue as in terms of disagreements about tax policy. Many thanks. Uh, Maureen Watt. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, the uh, public sector workers have been under sustained attack from Westminster governments over recent years, whether it be from their pay to their pensions, and I think that can only be halted uh, by independence. But can the Cabinet Secretary agree that by putting public uh, employee representatives on all public sector boards, we can give workers a real voice and the public improved services? Cabinet Secretary. So, you know, officer, I think one of the gains of uh, devolution and indeed the trade union movement in this country is the fact that we have a no compulsory redundancy policy uh, in the, the public sector. And in terms of the uh, directly answering uh, Mrs Watt's question, I think what we've seen in terms of employee representation at director level, at non-exec level and NHS boards um, has uh, proven to be very successful, uh, not just in terms of a more collegiate uh, workforce, uh, but in terms of managing change, communicating with the workforce and indeed I believe has delivered benefits to patients. Many thanks. And finally, Patrick Harvey. Phone for Mr. Harvey, please.
There we are. Okay. I thank the Minister for the statement, which recognises the importance of sustaining democracy in the workplace, as well as Recommendation 17 in the report, which seeks to give the new body a role in increasing democracy in the workplace. Is it a policy objective for the Scottish Government to increase workplace democracy? And if so, how will that be integrated into the range of business support services and grant schemes such as RSA, given, for example, the notorious track record of a company like Amazon? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I mean, uh, we do have uh, a policy position of supporting uh, workplace democracy uh, and uh, participation. Um, we, of course, as a government, have to reply uh, to the detail of this very extensive report. And can I say that uh, Recommendation 17 is very much linked uh, to Recommendation 10 in terms of how you get that infrastructure uh, for uh, social partnership. Can I just leave Patrick Harvey with a quote, actually, from the report um, on page 12, which I think is hugely significant. And it says that a number of recent initiatives undertaken by the Scottish Government and others suggest that there is a growing appreciation that what happens in the workplace is important and its influence on economic activity, performance, growth and inequality and that it's important as macroeconomic factors and therefore uh, gives us scope, uh, greater scope for intervention and workplace practices uh, that is going to make a difference to, to working lives. Many thanks, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the statement on working together progressive workplace policies in Scotland. I'll allow a few seconds for members to change places before the next item of business. The next item of business is a debate on motion number one. 0777 in the name of Nicola Sturgeon on welfare. I invite all members who wish to participate in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now, please. And I call on Nicola Sturgeon to speak to and move the motion. Deputy First Minister, 13 minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, debates on welfare always provoke in me, as I'm sure they do in many others in this chamber, conflicting emotions. Uh, firstly, I feel a sense of regret uh, that our welfare state, which is so often held up as one of the defining achievements of the Union, is being systematically dismantled, causing real and additional hardship to those in society who most need our help. There is now very strong evidence that the Tories' so-called welfare reforms are failing people right across Scotland and that their cuts are having a devastating impact on some of the most vulnerable individuals, families and communities in our society. Indeed, when the Secretary of State for Scotland says, as he did in April, that we are part of a fantastic system, I think he demonstrated just how, how out of touch he and indeed the other unionist parties are on these vital issues. So regret and a heavy heart are what I inevitably bring to any debate on welfare. But standing as we are just five weeks from the referendum, I also feel a real sense of hope. Uh, we have before us a precious opportunity to change course and to build, not overnight, but over time, a social security system that meets our needs. One that supports the needs of our economy by equipping people better for the world of work. One that supports the needs of individuals by ensuring that those who do work get a decent wage for the job that they do and one that supports the needs of the vulnerable by ensuring the decent safety net that I believe, and I know many people uh, agree with, is one of the hallmarks of a civilised society. So I think today's debate is an opportunity to crystallise the choice on offer. The choice between, on the one hand, increasing austerity and division under the present system, and on the other, a different, better, more progressive and supportive path with independence. Uh, as people consider that choice that is before them on the 18th of September, uh, they should of course do so in the knowledge that further Westminster cuts are still to come. Cuts that will impact most on women, on children and on the disabled. And as people consider that choice, I am confident that the policies we have outlined and the vision we put forward will encourage them to vote to take these powers into our own hands. Perfect illustration of that choice and a topic that we've discussed many times before in this parliament is the bedroom tax. 
Yesterday, the Welfare Reform Committee considered and uh, I'm glad to see agreed to support the Section 63 order to transfer the power over expenditure and discretionary housing payments to Scottish ministers. That's a welcome step. It's a step that means we can now ensure that no person in Scotland need be adversely affected by the bedroom tax. But, presiding officer, it is, is it not, a democratic outrage that a tax that had no political or popular support in Scotland was ever introduced here in the first place. And make, make no mistake, all we are able to do with the bedroom tax is mitigate, to take money from other parts of the Scottish budget to mitigate a policy that had this parliament had a say would never have been introduced at all. Section 63 order will not end the bedroom tax. Only by this parliament having the power to decide will we be able to do what the majority in Scotland, I believe the vast majority in Scotland, want, and that is to abolish the bedroom tax completely. And that is, I think, the nub of the matter, the nub of the debate we are having today, with the UK parties now battling to outdo each other and how tough they can be on welfare. It's becoming very clear that if we truly want a system that treats people with dignity and respect, then independence is the only option, the only way for us to achieve that. In Scotland's future, we set out a vision and a range of measures that will see us start to ensure that we have a welfare system more suited to Scottish needs. If there's a yes vote, we've said very clearly that we'll halt the rollout of universal credit and personal independence payments. We will abolish the bedroom tax and ensure that welfare payments increase in line with inflation to avoid the poorest families, those with the least in our society, being plunged further and deeper into poverty. We will increase carers' allowance to recognise the contribution that carers make and to end the situation where carers currently get the lowest rate of benefit of everyone claiming uh, benefits. And all of these policies will directly and positively impact on people's financial circumstances and on their quality of life. If there is a no vote, we will be unable, no matter how much we might try, and we will, to stop the rise in poverty that Westminster policies will cause. And there is no doubt that the impact is being felt most by the most vulnerable in particular by those with health conditions or disabilities. Uh, rather than help support individuals, Westminster is ploughing on with flawed systems like the now five times reviewed work capability assessment. And I warmly welcome the expert working group on welfare's report which recommended that the current work capability assessment is scrapped and it's something this government has committed to do when the powers to do so are in our hands. And, presiding officer, just this morning, we have published a research paper which lays bare the impact of the UK government's reforms on disabled people. It finds that disabled people in Scotland are likely to experience significant and disproportionate loss of income due to these Westminster cuts. Of the 190,000 existing claimants of disability living allowance who will be reassessed for personal independence payments, it's expected that more than 100,000 of them will lose some or all of their disability benefits by 2018, with a loss of at least £1,100 a year. People who get enhanced mobility support could lose up to £3,000 a year. And let's remember that for people in those circumstances, that's a loss that takes away more than pounds and pence, important though that is. That's a loss that could take away their very independence. Making cuts of this magnitude on the backs of disabled and sick people is, in my view, flatly wrong. And I believe it's time we got the powers to do something about that. Independent research has recently concluded that the cumulative impact of welfare reforms on income is particularly severe for households with disabled children and adults at about £1,500 per year on average. That impact is more than double the average reduction faced by non-disabled households. And we already know, all of us already know, that disabled people are more likely to be in poverty and face higher costs of living than non-disabled people. It beggars belief to me that in modern Scotland, we are prepared to stand by and watch this get worse. But of course, while disabled people are being hit disproportionately, they're not alone in bearing the brunt. We also know, we know from children's charities, 
that up to 100,000 more children will be pushed into poverty by 2020 if we stay on this Westminster path. In March, we published our child poverty strategy. It set out the progress that we're making in childcare, education, youth and unemployment. It showed that since devolution under this administration and the previous, there was a real improvement in the rates of child poverty in Scotland. That is to be welcomed, because I believe that while we may disagree on the best way to combat child poverty, everyone in this parliament is united in wanting to see it eradicated within a generation. But the latest figures show that the reduction in poverty that we have seen in recent years is now being reversed. Westminster cuts, like the reduction in in-work tax credits, are reducing incomes for some of our poorest households. Now, we will do, as we always should, everything possible in our power to ensure that no child lives in poverty, no child grows up in poverty. But the bottom line is this, when policies from Westminster are taking us in the wrong direction, when they're undermining all of those efforts, when they're cancelling out all that this parliament is able to do, then the case to take these decisions ourselves becomes absolutely overwhelming. Because by doing that, we can combine what we're already doing on education and support for young people with progressive policies on employment, on welfare and on benefits. And with that approach, we can begin to make real inroads into not just mitigating poverty, but alleviating it for good. It will take time, it will take effort, it will take determination. But we will have the powers and the access to our vast resources. We are, after all, one of the richest countries in the world to make it possible. And that has got to be better. That has got to be so much better than standing by powerless while Westminster does its damage to the most vulnerable and to the very fabric of our society. Presenting officer, I want to uh, start to draw my remarks to a close today by posing uh, some questions specifically to uh, my colleagues on the Labour benches. Because Labour's Tory and Lib Dem partners in the No campaign support the welfare policies of the Westminster government. I disagree with them. I disagree with them profoundly. But at least I know where they stand. Labour will claim today, I'm pretty sure, that they don't support the policies of the current Westminster government. They will say, and I suspect they're saying it more in hope than any serious expectation, that the answer to this is not independence, but a stronger Scottish Parliament and a Labour government at Westminster. So taking that, taking that at face value, I want to give Labour the opportunity today to answer a couple of very straight questions. And the questions I have for Jackie Bailey to answer are these. Firstly, what new powers is this Parliament guaranteed to get, short of a yes vote, that will allow us to stop the assault on the incomes of the disabled, of women and of children? And secondly, even if there is a Labour government at Westminster, and Jackie Bailey cannot guarantee that, but even if there is, what is it that that Labour government will do differently on welfare? Apart from abolishing the bedroom tax, what precisely is Ed Miliband going to do that is different to what David Cameron is already doing? Will Labour halt the rollout of personal independence payments? Will Labour protect the disabled from the cuts that I have outlined today that they stand to face if personal independence payments go ahead? Or is the reality that the disabled will face exactly the same cuts under Labour as they do under the Tories? These are important questions if we are to crystallise that choice that faces people on the 18th of September. If Jackie Bailey is about to get up and oppose these cuts like I do, but then argue that getting our own hands on the decision-making powers is not the best way to address them, then I would put it to everyone in this chamber that she needs to be specific, very specific, about what Labour at Westminster will do instead. And then she needs to tell us what will happen if Roger, we end please. up with another Tory government after all. I suspect, presiding officer, although I hope uh, that I'm wrong, that at the end of her speech we'll still be waiting for those answers which will prove the point that whether it's Labour or Tory, if we vote no, the outlook for the most vulnerable in our society will be exactly the same. 
Presiding officer, it's clear that the UK government under successive administrations has failed to deliver the changes needed to ensure a fair welfare system fit for all. Not only that, but the proposed so-called reforms that are currently underway are likely to make the situation worse. It is only with independence that we can create here in Scotland a social security system that is fair and one that treats people with dignity and respect. It's only this government and this parliament that can stand in the way of Westminster implementing further measures that will cause poverty, particularly child poverty, to increase. And the only way we can guarantee the powers we need to stop that happening is to take the power to decide these things into our own hands so that the future of our welfare Audrey, system please. is not decided by Tory governments at Westminster, but here in this parliament, so that we can build a better, fairer, more equal society. I move the motion in my name. Thank you. I should point out to the Chamber that we are tight for time this afternoon. I call on Jackie Bailey to speak to and move Amendment 10777.4. Nine minutes, please, Ms Bailey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I find it astonishing that, you know, from a party that can't even tell us which currency benefits will be paid in, I will take... I will absolutely take no lessons from Nicola Sturgeon, whose boss at the last general election encouraged people to vote Liberal. And look where that got us. Sit down. <laughs> Presiding officer, I Order, welcome the please. opportunity to Order. debate welfare because it was, of course, Labour in the post-war austerity years that was bold in its thinking, creating the welfare state and creating the NHS. And I am very clear, and Nicola Sturgeon's right, we are witnessing the destruction by the Conservative um, and Liberal Democrat government of that welfare state. There is no doubt in my mind that the consequences of the so-called Tory reform of the welfare system are frankly appalling. You do not need to look far to find examples of people being treated inhumanely, whether it is sanctions driving people to food banks or people waiting months and months for their personal independence payments. The distress is self-evident. And it is not just those who are unemployed that need help. There are increasing numbers of people at food banks who are employed but in low-paid jobs. We are facing a cost-of-living crisis, the likes of which has not been seen for decades. Wages are flatlining or declining. The price of everyday items is going up, a staggering 25% in the last five years alone. So just getting by is increasingly difficult. I believe there is a shared analysis about the extent of the misery caused by the Conservative policies for those who are disabled, those who are in unemployed or in low-paid jobs, and that for the majority in this chamber, a rejection of what can only be described as an ideologically driven attack on some of the poorest in our society. But the real question here is what we do about it. For the SNP, the answer is independence. Their answer to every question, no matter what that question is. When Labour was building the welfare state, the answer was independence. When we were creating the NHS, the answer was independence. And now as families face a cost of living crisis, the answer again is simply independence. The truth is that people in Scotland are caught between two governments with the wrong priorities. Absolutely. Obsession with the constitution blinds the Scottish Government from taking action now. We can provide people with much needed help now. We have the power to do so. It is frankly criminal not to use it. No, we can of course vote the Tories out, return a Labour Government in 2015, which is the quickest route to making a difference to people's lives. No, I think you should sit and listen. Can I welcome the efforts of the expert group on welfare, to be Members frank, not giving way. I expected more detail and a better understanding of costings from the SNP government. For many, many years now, they have argued for the transfer, no, for the transfer of power over welfare, yet the bulk of the recommendations will not be considered until after the, recommend, after the referendum. Again, as with much else in their proposals for independence, there is a lack of clarity, a lack of certainty, and there is considerable risk. People in Scotland deserve better than across your fingers and hope for the best approach to welfare and the future of the country. In a recent YouGov poll, and I, I'll take Amen. an intervention in a minute, in a recent YouGov poll, 79% of Scots said they wanted their pensions to be the same across the UK as did 75% of people for welfare. 
They agreed that pooling and sharing our resources across 63 million people rather than 5 million people make sense. Like us, they believe in something bigger than independence. They believe in social solidarity across the UK. They want the pensioner in Liverpool to be paid as the pens same as the pensioner in Linlithgow. The disabled person in Dundee to get the same support as the disabled person in Doncaster. And they want a child who is poor in Gateshead to be cared about just as much as the child who is poor in Glasgow. I'll take an intervention from Nicola Sturgeon if she can tell me why 79% of Scots are wrong. Deputy First Minister. What Jackie Bailey is setting out there is why people all over the UK should lose the same amount in benefit under the Tories. But I've got a very... We set out, we set out today Order, how please. the move to personal Order. independence payments will cost 100,000 disabled people more than £1,000 a year. Will Labour halt the rollout of personal independence payments, yes or no? Jackie to the, Bailey. The, the presiding officer, that clearly was a speech rather than a question. She has set herself, the Cabinet Secretary has set herself, Order, please. has set herself against Order. the 79% of Scots who believe in something bigger than independence. Let clearly, me deal Order, with, please. Let clearly, me deal with their announcement not taking on interventions. Allowance, because it is right that we recognise the contribution of carers to our society and provide them with support. I know the Cabinet Secretary acknowledges that increasing carers' allowance alone is no substitute for the range of other services that carers need, like respite. However, it is disappointing that the Scottish Government chose to spin the announcement, saying that 102,000 carers would be better off, costing almost £60 million, when she knows that this is just not true. What the Scottish Government failed to explain is that any carer who is in receipt of benefit would have carer's allowance offset against that. In other words, they would not receive that extra money. The true figure, supplied by the Office of National Statistics, is 57,000. It is often said, presiding officer, that the SNP Order, overclaim and underdeliver. And here is an unfortunate example of them doing just that. Let me turn to costs. There is very little in the paper that has been costed. And Order. I look forward to the Cabinet Secretary telling me the costings. Because without a price tag, this is nothing more than a wish list. Firstly, there are the set-up costs for our IT system, estimated to be £300 to £400 million. Yesterday, the Cabinet Secretary tried to suggest that we could just use the UK system, just like Northern Ireland, forgetting, of course, that they're going to remain in the United Kingdom whilst we would be a foreign country and we might not even have the same currency. But, you know, also using the UK system Order, means please. that she can't make the changes she says she wants to make. Secondly... Experts suggest. You know, look, she's Order, like a please, Miss Bailey, can I stop? Miss Bailey, can I stop you a moment, please? If members are not taking interventions, then other members who are trying should resume their seats, please, immediately. Jackie Bailey. Secondly, experts suggest that the cost of proposals for carers' allowance, the bedroom tax, the stopping the rollout of PIPs would cost at least three hundred and fifty million pounds. That's three hundred and fifty million pounds extra on the Social Security Bill each year. There's no detail of how we would pay for that. Instead, what we see is tax cuts for big businesses, the cost of which will be borne by the poorest in our society. Other proposals, like universal credit, uncosted, uprating benefits to meet the cost of living, Order. admirable but uncosted, replacing DLA and PIP, uncosted, and the very real prospect the very real prospect of reassessing disabled people as they transition from one benefit to another, causing even more distress, something the Cabinet Secretary did not deny when questioned yesterday. No costs, no detail, just vague promises about how it will all be better. But you know, it doesn't take constitutional change, it takes political will, no. Even where the SNP has control of welfare, they've not delivered. The Scottish Welfare Fund underspent at a time when the need is clear. One year to drag them kicking and screaming into this chamber to mitigate the bedroom tax. And I am pleased, I am so pleased Order. that yesterday, yesterday the Cabinet Secretary said there is nothing 
to stop local authorities from backdating to help those in arrears of bedroom tax from last year. That is a very welcome U-turn on their previous position. But you know, presiding officer, when it comes to tackling poverty, they have a record. They stripped £1 billion from programmes to tackle poverty. They underspent their budget on fuel poverty when the number of households in fuel poverty is at 900,000, an all-time high. And they refused to take action on the living the wage in the last procurement minute. when they had the chance to do so. Their actions speak louder than their words. And, presiding officer, experts say that the first Scottish Parliament post-independence will face a £6 billion deficit. £6 billion cut from public spending like schools, like hospitals, like welfare. Labour has an ambitious programme. We will increase the minimum wage. We will introduce workplace contracts to guarantee the living wage. We will tax bankers' bonuses to fund a job guarantee scheme for those out of work. We will scrape scrap sorry, the hated bedroom tax. We will transform work capability assessment. We'll tackle the huge backlog of PIP claims and we will devolve housing benefit and the work programme to Scotland. What Labour promise, Labour will deliver. What we've been promised by the SNP is vague, it's uncosted, it's likely to amount to hundreds of millions of pounds, more than we currently spend, and they've no idea how it's going to be paid for. Ms Bailey, I have given you some extra time for it, all of the interruptions, but you really must come to a close. I, my final sentence, presiding officer, it relies more on a cross your fingers and hope for the best approach. It is inherently dishonest, and the people of Scotland yep. deserve much better than that. Thank you. We have a long afternoon ahead in this debate. Can I remind members that if members are not taking interventions, then they must be respectful and resume their seats. Can I also remind members that comments from sedentary positions are not acceptable? Thank you. I now call on Alex Johnston to speak to and move Amendment 10777.2. Mr Johnston, six minutes. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. It comes as no surprise that the timing of this debate just five weeks before a referendum uh, has coincided with the publication of a report which allows the Scottish Government to make further claims about its position on welfare. However, the problem that drives us today is the one that this government does not realise the role that welfare pays, uh, plays in achieving an economic recovery. The Westminster government have made it quite clear that welfare does have a role in economic recovery. And it's no coincidence that we in this country, in the UK as a whole, have uh, the proportion of workless households is the lowest ever recorded. The number and proportion of children in these households is at a record low. The number of children in households where no one has ever worked is at its lowest level for some 15 years. The inactivity rate at 21.7% has never been lower, reflecting in falling numbers in cl claiming inactive benefits. Employment is up in every UK region. Since the election, three quarters of the rise in, uh, in employment are people working full time. And particularly in the 16 to 24 age group, uh, the number of those uh, not in employment or education or training is at the lowest level for over eight years. When we talk about these numbers, uh, the government in Scotland often like to claim a responsibility for that, but they cannot claim that responsibility if they pursue a negative por uh, policy in relation to our welfare reforms. And the key welfare reform, which has been raised by the, the, uh, the press release which came out this morning, is the change in disability benefits. And looking at the, um, looking at the press release that was published this morning, uh, the government make it clear that 100,000 Scots are expected to lose some or all of their UK disability benefits by 2018, with individuals set to lose uh, at least 1,120 per year. Now, these figures are figures that we have to look slightly more closely at. First of all, of the 190,000 Scots who are in receipt of disability benefit, if 100,000 are likely to lose out, then it's reasonable to expect that they're the bringing in of personal independence payments would actually benefit some 90,000 Scots, the 90,000 Scots who are most severely disabled. And that is the key change that moving from DLA to PIP is designed to satisfy. It is a desire to ensure that those who are in greatest need 
need benefit from the resource that is available. Of course, that figure of 100,000 that will see uh, their support reduced includes a significant proportion who, as a part of this change, will move from disability uh, payments onto universal credit. Of course, that reduction in the total budget is not accounted for by the Scottish Government and uh, consequently skews the figures. But the impression is also being given that the amount of money being paid in disability benefits is somehow reducing. Yet the figures that are available through the DWP, and I'm sure that someone will be willing to dispute them, appear to tell a very different story. The real terms budget for the current financial year is a record high. Uh, the money that is being paid in DLA will begin to tail off as we reach the end of this decade and PIP begins to kick in. In fact, it is not until the later years of this decade that the amount of money being paid in disabilities will, uh, allowances and benefits will begin to fall below the record high which we will see in the current year. However, at the same time, the take-up of universal credit will stop that gap, uh, plug that gap and ensure that nobody loses out. The key issue here is that we must ensure that as we move forward into economic recovery, we provide opportunities for those many people who would wish to work but have not had the opportunity to get back into the workforce. Unless we can deliver a viable, healthy workforce uh, in this country, we will not benefit from the recovery that is currently uh, ongoing. Now, I'd like to turn finally to the discussion which took place yesterday at the Welfare Reform Committee, and it's already been mentioned uh, by Jackie Bailey, because it was during that discussion that uh, Jackie Bailey, Michael McMahon and myself raised the issue of funding and how the Scottish Government intend to fund the promises they have made. Well, under questioning, it became relatively clear that the promises that are being made are by and large empty and unfunded. It would appear that the £6 billion that the Cabinet Secretary likes to talk about as the money that's being Order. removed from the overall budget uh, is not Order. to be misinterpreted as a promise to reinstate that money. There appears to be no uh, financial commitment in the years, first years of an independent Scotland to returning any of that resource uh, to the people whom the uh, Cabinet Secretary claims it has been taken off from. Uh, I will uh, finish with the taking the opportunity to ask a question of the Cabinet Secretary uh, and she can then answer that question uh, sometime later in the debate if the opportunity arises and that is will she be honest with the people of Scotland? Will she tell us prior to the 18th of September what it is she intends to spend additionally within the budget for welfare in an independent Scotland? Will she tell us how it will be spent, what will be spent, or will she come clean and tell us that she intends to spend not a penny more? Thank you. We now turn to the open debate. If we do have to pause for disruptions this afternoon, then obviously the time will come out of members' speeches. I call Kevin Stewart to be followed by Ken McIntosh. Maximum six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Uh, we've already heard this afternoon that the Secretary of State for Scotland, Alistair Carmichael, thinks that we have a fantastic welfare system. I would like to see Mr Carmichael uh, say that to some of my many constituents who are suffering because of these horrendous uh, welfare reforms that we are seeing from the Tory Liberal government in London, backed uh, by the Labour Party to the hilt. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, Jackie Bailey uh, said earlier on that our answer to everything was independence, which it's not, but her answer to everything seems to be stick with the Tories. That is the Labour answer. Stick with the Tories. That's certainly uh, not what I want to see uh, for Scotland. And let's look at some of the impacts of these welfare reforms. Since 2009, there has been a staggering increase in job seekers' allowance sanctions. In a written answer 
uh, to myself, uh, it shows that there has been a 65% increase in the number of disabled people who have been sanctioned in that time. A 76% increase in the amount of women being sanctioned and a staggering 563% increase in the amount of lone parents who have been sanctioned uh, over that period of time. It is absolutely clear that the current UK sanctions regime is neither ethical nor proportionate, and that it has the potential to leave already vulnerable people at risk of poverty. And we see uh, that poverty, uh, that increase in poverty, uh, by the rise in the usage of food banks in Scotland. A 400% rise uh, in the usage of food banks in the last year. An 1103% rise, according to the Trussell Trust, in the usage of food banks by children. I believe that that is completely and utterly unacceptable, and that is not the kind of society that I want to live in. However, it seems that uh, members of the Better Together campaign uh, feel that food bank usage is absolutely fine. And in a post uh, on Facebook, Better Together Aberdeenshire's Facebook page, reported in the Press and Journal today, uh, they claim that the rise in food bank demand was Scotland becoming a normal European country. Scotland becoming a normal European country. I don't know who wrote that, but quite frankly, they're off their head. I have to say that I want to live in a, a normal country, a normal independent country, where we don't have to rely on food banks, where families and children, including families in work, have to queue to get food parcels. That is not the kind of country that I want to live in. It may be uh, one that Better Together activists uh, want to live in. Uh, no, I won't, because uh, your side will not give way. Let me turn to some of the uh, other remarks that have been made by other groups uh, about these welfare reforms. Um, the welfare reform in Scotland, uh, the impact on people living with HIV and viral hepatitis report, uh, by HIV Scotland and Hepatitis Scotland says, the reforms are causing significant uncertainty and anxiety, worsening the mental and physical health of people in great need. What we have seen, or what I have seen, as I have uh, gone round various groups in recent times, is not just uncertainty and anxiety, but fear, absolute fear at what is going to happen to folks. The, M &A, the MS Society in Aberdeen recently uh, held uh, an open day where MSPs were invited to discuss uh, with uh, sufferers their fears uh, about the reforms that are, are uh, about to, to hit us. They have a great worry about PIP. Um, Ms Bailey has confirmed today that Labour will keep PIP um, in, in her speech today. Uh, a great fear that these folks will lose their independence or that their carers will be forced to leave work in order to care for them. I have to say that the vast bulk of the folks uh, who I have spoken to want to remain and work for as long as they possibly can. Final minute. And often their DLA parents, uh, payments are the way for them to be able to stay in work. Those DLA payments pro provide additional care so that their loved ones can continue to go uh, and work. So this great welfare reform policy, which was supposed to be uh, to ensure that folk who can work uh, will get work, um, is blown completely out of the water uh, because of these scenarios uh, that are uh, going to inevitably happen. This fear... This fear um, is immense. And what I want to see and what I want to live in is a country where we can replace hope uh, with fear and create a system that works for all. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. I call Ken McIntosh to be followed by John Mason.
Thank you, Presiding Officer. And too much of uh, my casework in the last couple of years has been about welfare, and in particular about the impact of the welfare reforms. We're all aware that times have been tough, and just when families and individuals have needed to fall back on our welfare safety net, they find that safety net withdrawn. People with disabilities have been filled with anxiety, even at the prospect of being reassessed. Families, whether because of sanctions or for a combination of reasons, have found themselves with no cash, no food and no fuel. Even beyond the immediate benefit system, we have the most vulnerable affected by decisions taken at all levels of government, but directly affecting their welfare. Students with additional needs find their college courses withdrawn. People the length and breadth of our country suffering from a lack of affordable housing. And so much as I am pleased to be discussing welfare yet again in Parliament today, this afternoon's motion also sums up much of my frustration with the independence debate and with the Scottish Government over the last three years. Labour and the SNP should be united on welfare, working together to oppose a Tory agenda we both resist, standing up for the vulnerable, trying to lift people out of poverty rather than blaming them for their misfortune, defending or even rebuilding a system based on the words of the expert group on dignity and respect rather than punishment and shame. Dave yes. Thompson. Yeah, I thank the member for taking the intervention. He mentioned there that Labour and the SNP should be united in relation to these welfare issues against the Tories. Does he not accept that the majority in this parliament, which would also be the case in an independent Scotland, would indeed be united against these welfare cuts and all these other things that are coming from the Tories. And between us and the SNP and Labour, we would be creating a far better, fairer welfare system in an independent Ken Scotland. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I recognise that the argument Mr Thompson uses, but I believe uh, the answer is twofold. One is that we should, yes, we should unite in this Parliament to use the powers of this Parliament to make a difference and to protect the people of Scotland. But it's also fundamentally an argument for getting rid of the Tory government at Westminster, mm -hmm. not for breaking up the whole of the country. Uh, I, I will. Okay, Deputy First Minister. Deputy First Minister. I, I, I really appreciate the tone that Ken McIntosh is striking. I think it's very positive, and I agree with much of what he said so far. I, I'm just not clear what it is that the Labour uh, Party is saying they will do differently on universal credit, on personal independence payments and some of the other changes that are causing so much hardship to what the Tories are doing. Ken, Maybe Ken McIntosh can be precise about that. Well, well, interestingly, to, to that, my response is that the SNP have actually modelled, and I'll expand to this, the SNP have actually modelled most of their policies on Labour, tried to copy Labour's policies. There's not that much difference, and I don't actually think there's very, any difference, or much difference, between what the SNP are trying to present as an independent Scotland and what we would be doing in the UK. It's simply whether you want to do it in independent Scotland or in the UK, and I, I, I genuinely don't think there's much difference. And the difficulty to me seems to be that although we do share a broadly similar approach, it's independence that gets in the way. For the Scottish Government and its supporters, independence is portrayed as the answer to welfare, yeah. just as Jackie said earlier, Jackie Bailey said earlier, it's the answer to nuclear disarmament, it's the answer to unemployment. The rest of us see it that as a simplistic and misleading distraction. Now, on the positive side, presenting officer, we only have to endure this for another five weeks. And I am optimistic. <laughs> I am optimistic that Scotland will emerge from a resounding no vote uh, and can unite around a shared vision for a progressive future. Because that's the language that has dominated the referendum debate, and it is one of the few positives that I think we can salvage from this national discussion. So, why is independence not the answer? We'll just take a few examples and food banks to begin with. Uh, the first minister faces a, a parliamentary question from my colleague Jackie Bailey tomorrow. And she'll ask whether there will be food banks in independent Scotland. And I'll be intrigued to hear his response, because the evidence presented to the Welfare Reform Committee was clear about the various reasons behind the growth and demand for such a basic as food. The rise in food, energy and housing costs being part of the story. But the introduction of various welfare reforms, including specifically the increased use of sanctions, being another. Now, Labour and SNP members on the committee are united in our frustration that UK ministers seem to be in deliberate denial about this link. But it's difficult to see how the SNP offer on welfare in an independent Scotland differs from Labour. According to the evidence we heard yesterday from the Deputy First Minister herself, the SNP, for example, want to end sanctions but maintain conditionality. And I thought there was an interesting contrast, in fact, between the Deputy First Minister's evidence, her relatively sober contribution to the Welfare Reform Committee yesterday, uh, and the entirely uncosted but stridently assertive motion in her name today. 
Yesterday, the Deputy First Minister painted a picture uh, of a reformed welfare system, but one which she said would not involve any net increased costs. But today we're back with the language, we've, we, we will stop the cuts, but with no detail of how that will be paid for. And I thought it was actually just amusing, if not certainly ironic, if not amusing, that uh, she asked for answers to questions that she won't even answer herself. Yeah. Welfare is inherently complex. Just to expand on why independence is not the answer, it's also worth reminding ourselves, for example, that although much of our discussion is focused around out-of-work benefits, most welfare spending goes on older people, including disability and housing support, but the largest single cost being the state pension. And in his infamous leaked cabinet paper, John Swinney himself noted the worries that exist over the affordability of pensions in an independent Scotland. Well, we know that the you Institute need to draw for, to a close. I, I, I will do, uh, presenting officer. The Institute for Fiscal Studies noted that the average age of the Scottish population will increase more rapidly than for the UK. And the ONS, the Office for National Statistics, said that Scotland is projected to have a higher and increasing dependency ratio amongst those of pension age. Uh, presiding officer, most Scots recognise that we are better off working together with, with the rest of the UK, pooling and sharing our resources, but also using the powers of this Parliament to make a difference, rather than simply using welfare to nurse a grievance with, well, with Westminster. Thank you. I'm sorry to advise Parliament that I don't have time to give back for interventions. Um, interventions must be contained in speeches. John Mason to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Hey, thank you, uh, presiding officer. If there was one more area I would like to see come to this parliament, parliament and we have responsibility for, it would certainly be welfare, for two main reasons. One, because it makes absolute sense. We are responsible for education, preparing young people and others for the workplace. We are responsible for health when people cannot, afford, uh, cannot work. We are responsible for getting more and better housing. We are responsible for trying to create more and better jobs. So the clear missing ingredient in that whole package is welfare and benefits and we should be looking to decide on them. We need a system which both helps and encourages folk into work if they are able to do so. But we see so many faults with the present system and we've been hearing a lot this afternoon, I'm sure we're going to hear more. But particularly that people are not financially better off if they get into work. People are working but they still need to get benefits to manage to live on on top of that. And currently the changes or cuts are especially hitting women, disabled folk, and younger people. And my second main reason would be because this Parliament, across the parties, particularly between Labour and the SNP, has shown an appetite for it, for dealing with welfare reform or welfare. We have set up a welfare reform committee, which we have not done for many other reserved matters. And when Labour asked for measures to deal with the bedroom tax, they were clearly pushing at an open door, as many of us, including John Swinney, the Cabinet Secretary, detested the bedroom tax and the main challenge was how to tackle it within the rules. Yeah. Now, if I could just look at some specific issues and firstly, sanctions. We had a number of briefings today, one being from the Child Poverty Action Group, and they list four effects, uh, impacts on children of the recent cut, uh, reforms. Real term cuts, secondly, reducing entitlement to tax credits, thirdly, reducing value of child benefits, and fourthly, sanctions and benefit delays. But the first three of these are talking about erosion and reduction and these kind of words. The fourth one, sanctions, is talking about people being left with absolutely no income at all. And that is what I find so awful about sanctions and, for that matter, benefit delay delays, where all income can be stopped, often for the slightest of reasons. And how is anyone meant to cope with that? Now, on this point, I realise we're not voting on Alison Johnson's amendment eh, with its reference to a citizen's income. And I realise eh, that is not without its challenges. But surely we could at least agree that that is a direction that we would all like to move in. And eh, whatever the situation, everyone would be entitled to a roof over their head, food and heat. Another point I would like to make is on food banks. Absolutely, yes. Ken McIntosh. It was just a question I put to the Deputy First Minister yesterday that the SNP's expert group on welfare has said that we should end sanctions, but says that we will have what they call positive conditionality which the First Minister, Deputy First Minister recognised are sanctions by another name. Does the member recognise that same description? John Mason. I mean, I think one of the key things the, the Deputy First Minister said it was about we cannot change the system overnight, but it's the direction we're going on. And that's what I want to stress in my argument today, that I think Labour and ourselves, and that the example has been the bedroom tax, want to move in the same direction to have a good, strong uh, welfare system. And part of that I think I would like to move to is the suggestion I've just uh, made, that there should be a certain level 
of unconditionality that people are entitled to a certain income no matter what, because that's what we give to prisoners, and presumably that's what everybody should be entitled to. Now, I'm going to uh, run out of time here, but just to mention food banks, uh, I was meeting Monday one of the local coordinators for the north and east of Glasgow, and she and I are both convinced that more people are needing to use food banks than are actually accessing them at the moment. A lot of people are reluctant to even go into a food bank and ask about it. Then they find out they've got to get a voucher. The DWP does not give out vouchers. The Citizens Advice Bureau do not give out vouchers. Many GPs do not give out vouchers. So it is not altogether easy to get food from a food bank. And the Trussell Trust is quite a strict system as to how often people can access food parcels. Frankly, that is not often enough if somebody has been sanctioned for 13 weeks. So the idea that food bank use is somehow greater than the actual need strikes me as totally unbelievable. At least in my area, I'm totally convinced that the need is greater than the current level of usage. Now, in the Equal Opportunities Committee, we've been particularly looking at a, a, a range of issues, but a, 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 we've had good briefings today, which I'm not going to be able to go into, but just to mention them in passing, gender, a, and gender has got a good briefing about how women are being affected so much more than men with the present cuts. 5.8 billion of the changes are hitting women, whereas the equivalent figure for men is only 2.2 billion. Disability Inclusion Scotland have briefed us that the current programme of welfare reform is having a devastating and disproportionate impact on disabled people in Scotland. Final minute. And young homeless people, eh, we're getting evidence tomorrow at the committee eh, from Action for Children saying that some young people also face sanctions in their housing benefit when they access certain training courses. So I guess my question for the anti-independence parties, and especially for Labour, would be, will you not support welfare coming to Holyrood, whatever the vote in September, and if not, why not? The sad fact is that a no vote is very unlikely to give more devolution. I guess that's why I find so disappointing about Labour's position in this chamber, although clearly Labour members outside, like Bob Holman in the East End of Glasgow, are strongly supporting independence. Why are Labour here putting the Constitution ahead of the real needs of their constituents? Why are they so focused on the Constitution and refusing change? Will they not just choose what is best for real needy people? Surely they would accept that Labour and the SNP here at Holyrood are going to produce together better welfare solutions than Labour and the Conservatives at Westminster. Even if we give the Labour amendment the benefit of the doubt and assume they win the 2015 UK election, the Tories are likely to be back in in 2020. Fred and then they will close. undo anything positive that has been done. So Labour have the choice. Do they want Labour and the SNP working together eh, to do welfare or do they want to alternate with the Tories at Westminster? Thank you very much. I'm afraid I now have to keep people strictly, members strictly to six minutes. Liam MacArthur to be followed by Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. And I welcome uh, this latest debate on welfare, an issue clearly of fundamental importance to people right across uh, the country. Indeed, I declare a personal interest as someone whose brother uh, has been a long-term recipient of DLA. So let me assure the Chamber at the outset that I need no persuading about the anxieties felt by those directly affected by these changes and indeed the associated uncertainty. And it's partly for this reason I believe we must be absolutely clear about what we're proposing to do and equally importantly why. It is also why we need to continue to listen carefully and be prepared to argue for change where evidence shows that things are not working. I do not doubt that the process of welfare reform has been difficult and unsettling but I do think that the UK government can legitimately claim to have been clear about the objectives of reform but also showing a willingness to listen and adapt where necessary, including in relation to the needs of cancer sufferers, those living in residential care, and of course the way in which the spare room levy is applied. This will need to continue, but it does not seek to shy away from the need for reform, something accepted by most independent experts and all political parties, including, it would seem, the SNP. And little wonder, the reality is this current system too often provides the wrong incentives. For too many people, it acts as a real obstacle to work. Over the period when our economy experienced almost uninterrupted growth, the welfare budget increased in real terms by around 40 per cent. And that makes no sense, nor is it sustainable. But this debate, of course, is not really about welfare. As ever, as the Cabinet Secretary herself admitted, it's all about the referendum and the belief that all would miraculously be better with independence. For the reasons I set out at the start and in the interests of those who are worried and may be tempted to take the SNP's promises at face value, those assertions need to be rigorously tested, <coughs> as Jackie Bailey, Alex Johnson and Ken McIntosh uh, did. So let us start with the case for reform. 
While the Cabinet Secretary denounces everyone else uh, for supporting reform, it is an agenda that she and her colleagues appear to accept. Why else set up the expert working group? However, the challenge facing this group was not insignificant. Members were presumably tasked with coming forward with proposals that would honour Ms Sturgeon's commitment to a welfare system that was, quote, fairer and simpler, would make work pay, that was, quote, innovative and included appropriate targeting, that didn't involve cuts, but which would not have the £2.5 billion needed to honour the promises made by SNP ministers in opposing almost every change put forward by the UK government. So how did they do? In truth, as well as could be expected. But after months of listening to SNP ministers and backbenchers rail against the work programme, against sanctions, against universal credit even, we now find that their own experts are recommending, to the surprise of no one, a work programme, sanctions and the principle of universal credit. Simply changing the name of these to pretend that somehow what you are proposing is radically different is disingenuous and leave, will leave many people across Scotland wondering what is the point of independence. As for the criticism of welfare caps and the threat to more cuts to come, the SNP's case is little more convincing. The First Minister himself has said, and I quote, the right cap deployed in the right way is a reasonable thing to have. So as far as Mr Salmon is concerned, the cap appears to fit. Meanwhile, the SNP's own fiscal commission has said that the Scottish Government will have to match the trajectory of debt reduction and Mr Swinney agrees. Little wonder then that the White Paper makes no mention of any commitment to increase spending by the £2.5 billion needed to make good on the promises regularly made by the SNP to reverse the cuts. Cuts, let's be clear, that are represented in Scotland by a welfare budget that is for the time being uh, going up and the Cabinet Secretary by all accounts was not able to shed any more light on that at the Welfare Committee yesterday. There doesn't even seem to be space in the White Paper to explain how the SNP would pay for <coughs> another of their top priorities backed by a motion of this Parliament to increase child benefit for those earning over 60,000 a year. So the SNP's claims on welfare don't stack up. Meanwhile, we now have the ridiculous claims that only a yes vote next month will save the NHS. What arrant nonsense. Since 2010, NHS funding in England is up £12.7 billion. The cash equivalent for Scotland is protected and can be spent by the Scottish Government in any way it sees fit. And the founding principles of being free at the point of delivery based on clinical need are unique and enduring. By contrast, as the IFS and ICAS have both pointed out, the costs of independence would lead to tax hikes and or spending cuts, which would inevitably affect the NHS in Scotland, a point agreed uh, to by John Swinney in his infamous briefing for Cabinet. No wonder a BMJ poll out today suggests 60 per cent of doctors believe we have the best of both worlds as part of the UK. Deputy Presiding Officer on Welfare, after three years of debates and much sound and fury, we know what the SNP don't like. But as Ken McIntosh rightly observed, what is not clear is how any of this would change in the event of Scotland leaving the UK and how the, any changes would be paid for or indeed in what currency. Simply rebranding key elements of what has been introduced by the UK Government while promising to reverse other changes but failing to say how much this would cost or how it would uh, be paid for won't wash. Deputy Presiding Officer, we need to create a welfare system that is simple to understand, lifts people out of poverty and makes work pay, while at the same as time providing those, an please. effective safety net for those who need it. But as I've said before, claiming to be in favour of reform, but holding the view that any cuts to any benefits or any tightening of any of the demands placed on recipients is automatically unfair just is not credible. No one in this chamber, including the SNP, has a monopoly on caring. But SNP scaremongering about the NHS Must or close, further please. welfare cuts while making promises they know they can't keep is not a more secure future for the people who need the support. Thanks so much. I now call on Annabel Ewing to be followed by Alex Rowley. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And as a member of this Parliament's Welfare Reform Committee, I am pleased to have been called to speak in this important uh, and revealing debate on welfare this afternoon, for it affords me the opportunity to ensure that no one is in any doubt as to what the impact is of the current Westminster government's current welfare cuts, uh, those coming down the line, and irrespective of whether it's Tory, Labour, Labour, Tory, that is the position, since the silence of the Labour Party today speaks volumes. There's nothing they're going to do differently from the Tories except the bedroom tax. Well, shame on them. What we are seeing, presiding officer, uh, before our very eyes is the dismantling of the welfare system and the removal of the safety net 
that should be embodied within it. And what kind of rotten, miserable society is being created by this Westminster system that harasses recently bereaved widows to leave their home of many decades uh, or, or pay a tax simply because there's a spare room? Or a system that says to those with MND that to avoid the bedroom tax, they should take in a lodger. A system that encourages the description of those with long-term conditions uh, who are unable to work as work shy. A system that forces decent, hard-working civil servants to make judges of Solomon about their fellow citizens in accordance with Kafka-esque criteria designed to lock their fellow citizens out of the little help that they are entitled to. As this motion states, the damaging and destructive impact of these Westminster welfare policies is being felt across uh, uh, communities the length and breadth of Scotland and is being experienced by families the length and breadth of Scotland. And in the time I have available today, I would wish to focus in particular on the impact on the disabled and on children, two of the most vulnerable groups in our society. And as we have heard, uh, the Scottish Government today published a comprehensive report uh, on the financial impacts of welfare reform on disabled people in Scotland. And it is very, very shocking reading. From what is clear from this report is that we will see more than 100,000 people in Scotland losing disability benefits uh, and uh, that uh, will be uh, not just a loss of financial support as the Deputy First Minister rightly pointed out but also uh, will have a devastating impact on the quality of life of disabled people and of their families and indeed as Inclusion Scotland have said in their helpful briefing for today's debate at paragraph 2 uh, dot one. It is clear that the prime motivation behind the replacement of disability living allowance by the personal independence payment has not been empowering disabled people to the same freedom, choice, dignity and control as other citizens to participate in society and live an ordinary life. Rather, it, ha it has been about cutting the uh, welfare uh, budget. Uh, and uh, there we have it in a nutshell. The treatment by Westminster of disabled people in 21st century Scotland is to be determined solely by the Treasury bean counters. Indeed, the Tories are so uh, interested in the possible ramifications for disabled people that they're having a little chat and telling some jokes, it seems, amongst themselves. Uh, this is an important debate, and I'm sure, I'm sure that uh, people across Scotland will have noted the lack of interest of the Tories uh, in the uh, interests of disabled people. Uh, it should be, of course, recalled that when the the Welfare uh, Reform Act was going through the legislative process. The Tory Liberal uh, Democrat, oh he's gone to Liberal Democrat government, uh, made it very clear, made it very clear, made it, no I'm sorry uh, Ms Bailey set the tone for taking interventions in this debate. Uh, the Tory Liberal uh, government made it very clear that what they were seeking to achieve was a 20% cut across the board. But there is another way, uh, presiding officer, and there is another future possible for our disabled citizens, a decent dignified future. For a yes vote on 18th September will enable Scotland to halt the abolition of DLA and to halt these cuts and to put in place over time a new welfare system, a welfare system for Scotland that is fit for purpose and is uh, progressive. A system that provides a safety net through which uh, individuals cannot fall. A system that will not see more than 100,000 children pushed into poverty by 2020. And a system that will not see as somehow acceptable that in the past year alone, 22,387 children had to rely on food banks in order to be able to eat. And I mention here again, as my uh, colleague Kevin Stewart did, the very, very curious uh, statement from the official Better Together outfit up in Aberdeenshire, who seem to think that somehow not only is such recourse, increased recourse to food banks acceptable uh, uh, in 21st century Scotland, but that somehow it is also uh, laudable. How can they steep so low, uh, presiding officer? And what a miserable, what a miserable uh, lot they are. Do they have no respect for basic human uh, dignity? Scotland is a wealthy country, uh, wealthier per head than France, Japan, and indeed the UK. Uh, as a whole. As the independent chair of the expert working group uh, on welfare and constitutional reform, Martin Evans said at our evidence session of the committee on 24 June uh, 2014, the evidence was quite wide ranging. Our expenditure in social protection overall as a percentage of gross domestic product is lower than the level of expenditure in the UK and lower than that in a significant number of other OECD countries. The taxes that are raised in Scotland pay for our system already. Well, there we have it. Uh, we have heard in conclusion, presiding officer, proof today that as far as Westminster is concerned, Labour Tory 
Tory Labour. It will make no difference for the most vulnerable members of our society. For Labour have made it quite clear by their silence, and they're sitting smirking away. They've made it quite clear by their silence that they have no intention of doing anything very much different from the Tories. It's time to take welfare decisions into our own hands to control our own resources. It is time to take this one opportunity to use our vast resources to build close, a fairer please. country. It is time to vote yes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I will call on Alex Rowley to be followed by Jimmy Hepburn. Thank you, President Officer. Um, when I came into the, the chamber today, I had, I had read the briefs and I then um, got a hold of the, the sheet and read this motion. And I have to say that, that the motion isn't about trying to build some kind of unity in terms of a way forward, in terms of welfare in Scotland. This, this, this motion put forward by Nicola Sturgeon is simply um, an attempt to try and win some yes votes as we move towards the referendum. Um, and I see that Nicola Sturgeon has, has, has rejoined us, but I would have to say that, that our policy seems to be where there is harmony, then uh, we will create discord, we will create division, and we will try and win votes uh, from that as, 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 as we move forward. When I think of the, the welfare state, um, I tend to think of beverage that, that Too many William, private conversations. William, Can we have Mr William Rowley, beverage. please? Um, and, and, and you know, his, his, his attempt or, or, or the paper that he brought forward at that time to tackle want, idleness, ignorance, disease and squalor, the, the five great evils, as, as he called them at that time. Um, and I'm sure, um, I would say to Liam MacArthur, that I'm sure that, that today William Beveridge would turn on his grave if he sees what these reforms are actually doing in terms of the way that they're impacting on people, not just in Scotland, but across, across the UK. Um, I recently visited the Benarte Food Bank, um, which is part of the Dunfermline uh, Food Bank, and, and, and I noted there that, that out of the 2,373 uh, vouchers that had been issued since April 2010 to July 2014. Um, the largest amount of them, 613 benefit changes, um, 710 benefit delays. The Trussell Trust does not account sanctions as such. Um, and then, then you go down and there's, there's, there's um, refusal of crisis loans. Um, so, so these are major factors in driving people into absolute poverty, where the very basic right and need that everyone has in this country to be able to feed themselves and eat is being denied. What I would say to the, the, to the Tories and to the Liberals is that you need to come out of denial. We have these food banks, we have major problems in our communities, and we need to examine why that is, stop being in denial that the problem exists, and start to look at how we can mitigate these issues that are there so that something that's unacceptable for the whole of Scotland, or the whole of the UK indeed, is that people are having to rely on charity to feed themselves. When I also think about the welfare state, I think about Clement Atley and the Atley government of 45 that brought about the creation of the welfare state and I think that, that, that great Welshman and political hero Nye Bevan who brought about the creation of the National Health Service, the National Health Service, um, one of the greatest social creations of, of that century and indeed into this century. And they recognise that by pooling and sharing the resources of 60 odd million people across the United Kingdom, we could build a welfare state, we could build a health service that would be the envy of the world. And that's why the answer to the current issues that we have is not narrow nationalism, that wants to create disharmony and put people against each other. It is about continuing to work to share the resources across the United Kingdom so that people in any part of the United Kingdom will work together when people are in difficulties in any part of the United Kingdom. But my view would be very much that we have to be tough on poverty and tough on the causes of poverty. If we look at being tough on poverty itself, and I think the Oxfam briefing that was sent out earlier highlights 
Clyde Bank Independent Resource Centre, where they supported clients to claim over £3.5 million in 2013-14 um, in monies that was not being claimed. And my criticism, in a sense, in, in one of the areas of the Scottish Government is that they are not working with um, local authorities working with organisations across Scotland so that we can be tough on poverty. I saw Nicola Sturgeon on the television the other night and I thought she was announcing a new half million pounds for food banks. I discovered the following day that it was the same half million that had been announced previously. It was just saying how the money was to be spent. And I know that, that, that I think £10,000 of that money was coming to Fife. But we need to work with the local authorities and work at the local local level to ensure that we're maximising how we actually are tough on poverty. In terms of some of the policies, and I would have to say again, the SNP government have a terrible record over the last seven years in terms of trying to tackle inequality. I will pitch the Labour government record either in the UK or Members in Scotland against, against that record any time and any place. In Scotland, 200,000 children lifted out of poverty half in pension of poverty. These are all achievements under a Labour government. If we look at the SNP record on tackling equality, they should indeed certainly have nothing to be proud of. But in terms of being tough on the causes of poverty, there is even close. less to be proud of. If we look at the cuts in colleges, we need to look at full employment. I have said time and time again that throughout the history of the Labour movement, the Jaro marchers, the UC working, the Upper Shite Clyde, ship workers, none of these people marched for benefits. They marched for jobs. And their objective should be full employment, giving people the opportunities, being more close, ambitious please. for young people in a life on benefits, getting them the training, the skills and the jobs so that they can have a prosperous future. Again, the SNP Riley, have failed close, and failed drastically. Thank you. Now call on Jamie Hepburn to be followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you very much, President Officer. Let me say to Riley, I'm very proud of uh, this Scottish Government's uh, efforts to tackle and mitigate the effects of the bedroom tax by funnelling additional monies. I'm very proud of this Scottish Government's efforts to uh, make up the shortfall that was handed by, uh, down by the UK Government to, in terms of council tax benefit. And I'm very proud of the additional money that was funnelled into the Scottish Welfare Fund. These are things that are happening here and now that we can be uh, proud of. Can I thank uh, the Scottish Government for bringing uh, forward today's uh, debate? I think it's important uh, to go back uh, to first uh, principles. I think inherent within the uh, Labour Amendment uh, today and uh, Jackie Bailey's uh, contribution is the uh, idea that Scotland is somehow a basket case and can't afford to provide for a decent and fair uh, social security system. Her contribution uh, today was matched by her line of questioning at yesterday's uh, welfare reform committee. No welcome for the Scottish Government's commitment to abolish the bedroom tax. No welcome for the Scottish Government commitment to provide carers allowance at the same level as job seekers allowance and the Deputy First Minister's commitment to do more for carers beyond that uh, 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 commitment. Uh, no welcome to replace the work cap uh, capability assessment with a fairer uh, uh, system. Then, officer, the affordability of our social security system is uh, undeniably important, but so also is ambition, so also is vision. So also is the determination to do better, and I didn't get that sense of drive from Ms Bailey's uh, contribution today. And we know uh, that in 2012-13, 42.3% of Scottish tax revenues were spent on welfare and pensions, social protection, compared with 43% for the UK uh, as a whole. And we know that spending on social protection as a share of GDP has been lower in Scotland than the UK in each of the past five years. So we know that Scotland can afford a better system, a point made by the independent expert group on welfare. Can I turn to the report the Scottish Government published today on the impact of welfare reform on disabled people? Can I say I think the findings of that report tally uh, largely with the report uh, that, uh, 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 that Sheffield Hallam University prepared uh, for the Welfare Reform Committee? And of the Scottish Government reports today of the 190,000 existing DLA claimants in Scotland who will be reassessed for PIP, it is expected that around 105,000 working age disabled people will lose some or all of their disability benefits by 2018 with a loss of at least £1,120 per year, an absolute disgrace uh, in 21st century uh, Scotland. And I heard uh, Alec Johnson on uh, GMS this morning uh, regarding disability benefits. He said uh, the headline budget for this will actually increase. It won't reduce. And he said this is not 
about reducing budgets. He needs to tell the Treasury and the Treasury's 2013 budget document estimates reduced spend due to disability living allowance reform of nearly £3 billion a year by 2017-18. Scottish disabled people are expected to shoulder around £310 million of that by 2017-18. And I go back to the uh, point that Annabel Ewing made. Inclusion Scotland is uh, saying the motivation behind the replacement of DLA uh, with PIP has been about cutting uh, the welfare budget. That's what people are saying. Mr Johnson, I think you need to take that on board. Can I turn uh, to the issue of, of food banks that has been uh, mentioned in the debate, uh, President Officer? Uh, uh, Citizens Advice Scotland tells between January and March 2014, uh, Citizens Advice Bureau in Scotland recorded 11, uh, 100, uh, 11, uh, sorry, 1,311 uh, new food parcel issues, equating to one food parcel issue for every 50 clients who received advice. Uh, Oxfam, who Alec Rowley uh, mentioned, uh, reminds that in Scotland, the Trussell Trust distributed 640,000 uh, meals last year, a five-fold increase on the previous year. Large rises are also uh, reported by other providers, and they go on to say that the evidence clearly shows that changes uh, to the welfare system are a significant driver of rising food bank use. Uh, so it was... Uh, uh, not without some sense of incredulity uh, that I read the comments of Better Together Aberdeenshire that Kevin Stewart and Annabel Ewing mentioned. I want to uh, read out what they say. Uh, far from being a sign of failure, they, food banks, are an enriching example of human compassion, faith and social cohesion. Well, undoubtedly, uh, they are a sign of human compassion, the compassion of those who give up so much of their time uh, to uh, help uh, others and for many of them a sign of their faith as well. But the idea that it is a sign of social cohesion, that the idea that they are not a sign of failure is something I think no one, uh, no one with their head screwed on, frankly, uh, could recognise to be the case. And the, the Better Together Aberdeenshire group go on, they say that to raise uh, this issue insults the thousands of people who contribute, who run and use uh, food banks. Well, let's, let's hear what those who run food banks say. Uh, the Welfare Reform Committee was told by Joe Roberts of Community Food Murray that her organisation were having to provide more cold food parcels because they were seeing uh, more people uh, who, for whom food is a priority and electricity and heating are not. And Dennis Curran of Lowe's and Fishes and very compelling evidence uh, to us, uh, President Officer, uh, to told uh, us that people are getting penalised for being poor, for not having, for not having the ability to do, for not having a job and for going to the food bank. So I do not understand how better together uh, uh, Aberdeenshire can take the position to do. Can I conclude uh, briefly, President Officer, referring to the Labour Amendment today, which concludes the best way of helping people out of poverty is the return of a Labour government in 2015. We've heard that today, but that, of course, is not in our hands here in Scotland. Scotland has voted Labour she at UK applause, general please. elections for the entirety of my life and for many years before. But the Tories have formed the government of Scotland for two-thirds of that period. If this is Labour's prescription for providing a fairer social security system, for tackling poverty, what happens if the Tories win next year? Or is the point made by my colleague John Mason at some point uh, subsequent in the future? That's why, although Jackie Wheeler is right, it does take political will you to make close, decisions. Please. That's why the constitution is important in this case, because this government has the political will, but it doesn't have the means to exercise that will. That's why we need a yes vote on the 18th of September. Thank you. Now I call on Alison Johnson to be followed by Siobhan McMahon. We're tight for time. Up to six minutes less would be more. Thank you. Thank you, presiding officer. This is one of the most important debates we can have in the lead-up to the referendum. The creation of the post-war welfare state was a great progressive leap forward for society. We should be rightly proud of the struggle for a system which aims to ensure that nobody is left in poverty or destitution. Instead, we have seen the UK government seek to stoke division between people. David Cameron's use of the words scrounger and shirker to describe people receiving support is divisive and an attempt to legitimise his government's reforms, which have not focused on the welfare and mental health of people most in need or the urgent need to address inequality in our society. All MSPs have received a welcome flood of briefings for today's debate. One from Engender stuck out. Their headline, shocking figure, is that since 2010, 74% of cuts to benefits, tax credits, pay and pensions have been taken from women. They point out that this rises to 81% of the savings realised by the Treasury in 2014-15. It's clear that women are being hit by a gendered austerity. And gender point out that UK welfare reform has just exacerbated a gender inequality already pervasive in society. And the Fawcett Society has identified three main ways in which women are being chiefly hit by the cuts. 
through the loss of benefits and services, through the loss of public sector jobs, and as state services are withdrawn, women will have to fill in the gap and take up further care and community responsibilities. It's hard to believe that the gender pay gap in Scotland is 13% for full-time work and 34% for part-time. Women, who predominantly still manage caring duties, probably can't find enough hours in the week or extra hours from their employer to bring their wages into line with their male counterparts. Employment law is still reserved to Westminster. Why has such little progress been made? On average, women do four hours and 15 minutes of unpaid work a day, compared to men's two hours and 18 minutes. Some 40% of women in employment rely on relatives for childcare, a majority of them are female, and one in four women in their 50s is caring for a disabled or frail elderly relative. The UK government is keen to see the pension age lifted rapidly. And if women who do not choose to are required to continue working, who's going to take on these caring roles? Presiding officer, the Green Amendment for today, it wasn't selected, but it refers to the Scottish Government's expert group on welfare. And they identified two long-term but divergent visions for the future of social security. One vision was a contributions-based scheme, described by the expert group as a highly individual approach, tying benefits to personal contributions and savings. This approach requires the complexity of means testing and constant assessment to ensure that nobody gets more than they need. The other vision was a universal one, which abandons means testing and complexity and provides a citizen's basic income to everyone. Professor Ilsa Mackay was a member of the expert group, a feminist economist and a lifelong advocate of this universal approach. She sadly passed away before the publication of the report and is greatly missed by her family and friends. But I have no doubt at all that her contribution to this welfare debate will continue. Glasgow University are advertising to fill the newly created Ilsa Mackay Postdoctoral Research Fellowship in Economics to further research the relationship between a citizen's income and gender equality. A citizen's income is at the foundation of the Green Vision for Social Security, and this week the Green Yes campaign has published a new paper demonstrating how a citizen's income could work and be paid for in Scotland. And I thank John Mason for his open-minded comments regarding a citizen's income and a certain level of unconditionality. Now, it's not a perfect proposal, but it's designed to demonstrate how Scotland can begin on its journey towards rebuilding a fair welfare system with universality at its core. And the modelling we've done with David Comerford from Stirling University demonstrates how Scotland could join the ranks of the most equal countries in the world. Under the citizens' income proposal, 70% of the lowest earning households would be better off, with the highest earning households losing only 11% of their income. Citizens' income is a simple idea that could reduce inequality, promote solidarity and allow each of us to make our own decisions about working, caring, learning and creating without ending up on the breadline. But while we consider a citizen's income, we can currently crack down on corporate and rich individual tax dodging. We can call for an end to the inhumane sanctions regime that has led to hundreds of thousands of people relying on food banks or applying in desperation for a hardship or crisis loan. Food banks must not become the norm. People should have the dignity of buying their food. And I agree with Oxfam when they say that the huge, rank, the huge rise of food banks suggests that the principle of the social safety net is under threat, and we must do all that we can to protect it. In closing, presiding officer, I would ask Alex Johnston, you state in your motion that the UK government seeks to work to make work pay. Well, if work pays, why are there now, as the Oxfam briefing points out, more people in poverty living in working households than in out-of-work households? And Jackie Bailey, I agree that eradicating poverty requires political will. However, the current constitutional arrangement means that policies Would increasing poverty in Scotland can be forced upon us by those whose politics aren't focused on the eradication of poverty and those who we didn't vote into government in Scotland. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much. Now I call on Siobhan McMahon. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I spoke in nearly all of the welfare debates this Parliament has held since my election in 2011. It's a subject that is very close to my heart and one that I'm extremely passionate about. It's also a subject that is far from easy. We all have a different idea of what the welfare state's purpose should be. 
That will be born out of political ideology in many cases, but also shaped by our own experiences of the system. Did it work when we needed it to, or did it fail us in our time of need? For too many people across the UK today, the answer will be that the system has failed them. For too many people, the answer will be that it added to the burden they were already experiencing and has done very little to alleviate the financial strain they now find themselves trying to deal with day in and day out. As the schools across Scotland start back this week, there will be many parents thankful and relieved that they don't have to find the money to send their children to the cinema or swimming or to the local fun fair in order to be just like their friends and have a good time during their summer holidays. But there will be other parents who are still worrying about how they are going to pay back the debt they are now in as a result of paying for their children's school uniform, the new school shoes, the school bag, pencil case and everything needed to go into the pencil case and everything else in between. However, that example is something that we in this parliament should be doing something about, not in other parliaments. We could and should be taking the opportunity today to talk about the things that we have the power of control over and how we can change people's lives. We could be talking about the one in eight people who are carers across Scotland and need our help now. We could be talking about the problems many of our disabled constituents have with transition services, or we could be talking about the lack of employment opportunities, especially for females and young people. Instead, we are debating what an independent Scotland's welfare system might look like. That in itself would be OK if the Scottish Government actually had a vision of the welfare state they would wish to see. But as we know, we get a list of things presented to us that they don't like about the current welfare state and so-called reforms, and things that they wouldn't do, like the work capability assessments or sanctions, but we get little or no information as to what would replace such things. In our briefings for today's debate, the start figure of 60,000 people in Scotland being sanctioned between October 2012 and December 2013 stands out. It is a horrific number and not something that can be easily explained away. That is 60,000 individuals, but also their families and dependents. That is an atrocious figure and a figure that the UK Government should be ashamed of. As I have previously stated, I understand that the Scottish Government would not impose sanctions on disabled people who have been found fit for work. I welcome this, however, I am unclear as to what would take its place. In their own words, the Scottish Government stated that sanctions would be replaced with a system that is more proportionate, personal and positive. That is as clear as mud. The Scottish Government have also said they will abolish work capability assessments. Again, we don't know what would take their place. The Scottish Government's own expert group has made clear that assessment for incapacity benefits is necessary, but the SNP will not formulate any alternative to work capability assessment before the referendum. In contrast, the Labour Party asked a group of people for ideas on how to make things easier for people with disabilities. As a result of this task force, 28 recommendations were made, including recommendations about the work capability assessment. Labour has said that we will transform the work capability assessment to make it more effective at helping disabled people into employment. The assessment that is carried out presently does not take into consideration the disabled person's ability to work. Therefore, we have pledged to end the tick-in-a-box assessment and replace it with one that would include a detailed analysis of the jobs that each individual person could carry out and have a successful career in. Further to this, we would ensure that the person undergoing the assessment would receive a copy of the assessor's report on how their disability or health condition may affect their ability to work and what support is available to them in order that they can work within their local area. Perhaps most importantly, Labour have committed to making sure that disabled people are given the central role in monitoring how the tests are conducted. They will also be asked for suggestions on how the assessment can be improved. As our Shadow Minister for Disabled People, Kate Green MP, has said, we want the assessment to be part of the process of ensuring disabled people who can work get the support they need to do so, not to threaten or punish them. The test should be a gateway to identify and assembling that support. We also recognise that not everyone can work and we are committed to ensuring that support is in place for those who can't. The opposition benches may not agree with the vision that we, the Labour Party, have put forward. But one thing is clear. We have a vision and, not one, that, and one that we will openly talk about. Of course, the hardship that many people are experiencing at the moment is not simply down to the work capability assessments. Whilst it is true that disabled people are nine times more likely to be affected by the austerity agenda, they are not alone. As Oxfam Scotland said in the briefing for today's debate, the evidence clearly shows the changes to the welfare system are a significant driver of rising food bank use. 
Research published in June shows that over 20 million meals were distributed by UK food banks in the last year, an increase of 54% on the previous year. These statistics are stomach churning, but what the people who are using these services like these need is a solution to their problems, problems that have been inflicted on them. They need that now, not in five weeks or five months, but now. This Parliament is letting every single person who has used a food bank down by simply talking about the problem and using it as a football for a debate on the Constitution. Mr. That is Dr. something Close. I won't be part of. Finally, Presiding Officer, the general election next year will mark 70 years since Clement Attlee, the founder of the welfare state, became Prime Minister. I want to attend with a poem Attlee wrote that struck a chord with me when thinking about today's debate. I'm afraid you're out of time, so for another day, it's perhaps. No, in my house and lighthouse by night as day, I hear the feet of children who go to work or play. Of children born of sorrow, the workers of tomorrow. How shall they work tomorrow who get no bread today? Thanks very much. Now call a move to closing speeches. Murder Fraser, six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. This has been, uh, at times, a rather bad-tempered debate. I hope I can bring some calm and sense to the close. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Presiding Officer, this is a good day to be discussing welfare reform. This morning, the latest unemployment and workforce figures were produced. Unemployment is down again in Scotland across the UK to a total of 6.4%. The employment rate in Scotland has reached a record new high. Since the UK coalition government came to power, some 1.8 million new jobs have been created, three quarters of which are in full-time positions. Why is this important? Because probably a, a rare point of agreement in this debate I would have with Alec Rowley but like him, I believe that creating jobs for people is the best way to improve their living standards and reduce their dependence on welfare. And welfare reform is working. As Alex Johnson reminded us, today the proportion of workless households is the lowest ever recorded. The number and proportion of children in those households is at a record low. The number of children in households where no one has ever worked is at its lowest level for 15 years. The inactivity rate has never been lower, reflected in following numbers claiming inactive benefits. The welfare system the current coalition government inherited was broken. It had too many disincentives uh, for people uh, to work and try and better their situation. And the current UK government's approach to try and reverse this is clearly having an impact. And welfare reform is popular. According to a Nipsell's Mori poll carried out last year, 50% of people in Scotland believed that the welfare system was too generous against just 25% who thought it was not generous enough. And a similar poll showed that 73% of people in Scotland supported a general benefit cap as against just 12% opposed. Actually, more support in Scotland for a benefit cap than across the UK as a whole. Now, Liam MacArthur reminded us that everyone agrees with welfare reform, or so they say. Everyone agrees that the previous system simply didn't help people when they needed help and that it was seeing costs rise too quickly. But whilst those in other parties claim to support welfare reform, in practice they oppose every single measure brought forward by the UK government to try and deal with it. If they did believe in welfare reform, then they need to tell us precisely what measures they would implement to reduce the growth in the welfare budget. I'd like to turn to some of the points raised in the debate. Uh, Alex Johnson uh, reminded us that we regularly hear from the SNP that welfare reform is taking £6 billion out of the economy. Now, that claim would have some credibility if the SNP were proposing on independence to reverse those so-called cuts. So let's look precisely at what the SNP are proposing in their white paper. We know that by far the two biggest components in the £6 billion are firstly changing the uprating of benefits to inflation, linking from RPI to CPI, and secondly, the removal of child benefit from higher earners. Between them, these two changes make up the vast bulk of these savings. And what is in the white paper about reversing these changes? Nothing I could see. The white paper does say benefits will rise with inflation. Is this CPI? Is it RPI? We can only assume it's CPI. If I'm wrong, no doubt I'll stand corrected in the Minister's wind up. The only detailed proposals in the white paper on welfare are to remove the spare room subsidy, which we know has already been mitigated by the actions of this devolved parliament, and to stop the rollout of universal credit and personal independence payments. The best that can be said about these changes is that the costs of these are marginal in the context 
of the total savings from welfare reform. So the whole proposition being put forward in this debate by the SNP, that voting independence will make a huge difference when it comes to welfare, and in the words of the government motion, and I quote, only with the full powers of independence can the UK government welfare cuts be halted, is shown to be utterly worthless, because the bulk of those reductions are not being reversed under the proposals from the SNP. And what would the welfare system under independent Scotland be? We don't know. How much would it cost? We don't know. Would taxes have to rise to pay for higher benefits? We don't know. And as Jackie Bailey reminded us, we don't even know which currency these benefits would be paid in. The SNP are using welfare policy to try and argue the case for independence, but without any detail on the, their alternatives, the claims they are making are simply dishonest. Yesterday at the Welfare Reform Committee, Nicola Sturgeon, I understand, said that she foresaw no net increase in welfare costs in independent Scotland beyond the proposals already announced. Today, sorry, that, the, the, from a sedentary position, the Cabinet Secretary has corrected me. She says that's what the Welfare Review Group recommended. Well, I'll be interested to know what the SNP are recommending, because we've heard nothing in this debate about their proposals. She comes to this chamber this afternoon and seems to suggest otherwise. All the rhetoric is about reversing all the cuts from Westminster. That's not what she said yesterday, and that's not what a review group had to say. In his last minute. Members in his last minute, I'm sorry. I'd have been happy to give way, but perhaps in the wind-up your colleague can address these very points. Presiding officer, we know from the work done by, by the Institute for Fiscal Studies that an independent Scotland would face greater fiscal challenges than if we stayed in the UK. There is no magic money tree. There will not be more money to spend on benefits if we become independent. In fact, there will be less. And what the SNP are trying to do is quite cynically play on the fears of those in poverty or the disabled by promising that independence will mean they have more money and greater security. And yet they cannot produce Most any schools. concrete policies to back up these proposals. It is a deeply cynical and disgraceful tactic of which SNP members should be ashamed. Yeah. Thank you very much. I now call on Michael McMahon. Up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I welcomed the prospect of this afternoon's debate on welfare when I learned that it had been scheduled because it's absolutely right that the people of Scotland should hear from the Scottish Government how it plans to introduce its robust, effective, reliable and affordable welfare system in an independent Scotland. What a pity then that for far too much of the time this afternoon all we've heard is that the SNP don't like Westminster, they don't like the current system of welfare in the UK, but we've heard virtually nothing about what change there would be if Scotland votes yes on September the 18th. I'd like to make some progress, if you don't mind, first. Now, when we should have had real answers over how our welfare system would continue if we separated, what we've got is an aspirational wish list of vague promises of a fairer system with no price tag attached. Now, there is nothing wrong with being aspirational for your country and its people. We all are. But it's all very well criticising the current welfare system without providing answers on the detail of what they would seek to replace it with. We've been repeatedly promised such information, but it's never materialised. And unless the Minister reveals the SNP's blueprint to us in her closing speech, the SNP looks as though it's going to continue to ask the people of Scotland to vote in the referendum on a prospectus that sees a welfare-shaped black hole at its core. Nicola Sturgeon. What I'm saying now, I've said it before and I'll say it again, is that we're saying that if we get the powers, we will not proceed with a £300 million cut in support for disabled people. Can Michael McMahon answer me the question, will a Labour government at Westminster proceed with those cuts or not? It's a simple question. Can we have a straight answer? Michael McMahon. I'm quite sure the, the Cabinet Secretary would like to boil everything down to a straight yes or no answer, but the fact of the, but the, fact of the matter is, you are... You are you are premising all your questions. You are premising all your questions on a vote five weeks from now. The Labour Party is looking at promoting the welfare system at the general election in 2015, and we will get we will get the answers at that time when we have won when we Order. have won this when we have won this referendum. You'll get more answers than we'll get Order. from you, and that's a fact. So I welcome the report of the expert working group. But that body was never going to produce the detailed answers we need because it was never given the remit from the Scottish Government to do so. The expert group identified that there are difficulties in designing entirely new schemes and that the timescales involved in ensuring that they operate effectively 
will mean that any changes are unlikely to be in place by 2016. Indeed, the expert group's first report suggested that Scotland should share its system with the UK for a transitional period which would last for at least five years. And that was before we got the complication of not knowing what the currency would be that we would use while we shared that system. So the Scottish Government subsequently announced that it wished to make priority changes to Social Security immediately following separation. But it's not yet set out how it would be able to consult, legislate and then design and build and test a new system within 18 months. So what we have is a recommendation for a national convention on welfare to be formed in 2015 to discuss the details of benefits proposals which they say we have to vote on in five weeks' time. So that means that the detail will not be known un until after the referendum. So over half of Scots receive Social Security payments in some form, but the SNP will not tell us how much it will cost to set up a new welfare system when independent forecasters like the IFS are showing that we're projected to have a worse fiscal position than the UK as a whole in the years ahead. So rather than this afternoon's debate clarifying for the Scottish people what they can expect from the welfare system in independent Scotland, the only welfare gu guarantee we have from the SNP is uncertainty. And as the debate wore on, it appeared, as Jamie Hepburn and others uh, referred, to this Better Together Aberdeen Facebook. Now, I pay all deference to my colleague Lewis McDonald, but the people of Aberdeen are very often beyond uh, my comprehension. But, <laughs> but I, I do not understand why the SNP members repeatedly went on about this face, but it looks as though it might well be the new issue, rather than pandas, aliens, and what side of the road we're going to drive on when it comes to the next television debate. Well done. So, no, I'm certainly not going to give way to you after your disgraceful contribution. <laughs> but we did see some agreement in this afternoon's debate on sanctions, on the bedroom tax, on food banks. Kevin Stewart, John Mason, Ken McIntosh, others we found common cause. The Cabinet Secretary and Siobhan McMahon clearly uh, passionately believe in issues around uh, disability, and that's quite right, because when Inclusion Scotland make absolutely clear that the current programme of welfare reform is having a devastating and disproportionate impact on disabled people in Scotland, we have to take cognizance of that. But John Mason asked, and I think this was very important, he said he made a very reasonable request that we should work together and he asked why, when we had such agreement, that we could not work with them. Ms Sturgeon, on the other hand, claimed that Labour didn't care about Scotland's poor. But that was the difference. We focus more on need and not nationality. And that's what divides us and what you cannot understand about this debate. So the SNP's plans for post-independence welfare are paper thin. And even their own expert group on welfare has said that there would be a serious risk of disruption to benefit payments if we were to leave the UK benefit system. And again, they made that report before we had the issue of the, the currency union and its uh, inability to operate. So where the SNP has made pledges, they have not brought forward proposals for what the system would be changed to. So we've come along this afternoon to look for answers on what we'd be voting on in September, but we're left with no conclusion other than that the only safe choice on welfare is a vote to remain part of the British welfare state that I am proud to say Labour created and that we will always be the best to defend. Thanks so much. And we we'll now call on the Minister Margaret Burgess to wind up the debate. You have until five o'clock, please. OK, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, and like others, I don't think this has been the best uh, debate in terms of um, temperament that we've heard through it. But there's something that was just said there at the end of the debate that I absolutely agree with. And that is that we're absolutely miles apart from the Labour Party and their better together uh, pals of how we can address the issue of social security, in particular in an independent yeah. Scotland. And the first thing I would want to say at the very start of this debate, the Deputy First Minister asked two questions to Jackie Bailey about Labour's position. She asked, what new powers is this Parliament guaranteed if we, um, short of a yes vote? and that would allow us to stop the inc assault on the incomes of disabled women and children. She was also asked 
Would the Labour Party um, halt the rollout of personal independence payment? And we didn't get an answer to that. There is no answer, and nobody in the Labour bench has answered that question. And the reason why is because the answer is no. They don't know, and they're not. They're tied to the same system, the Westminster system, with their pals in the Tory party. And that is very clear in this debate. They've huffed and hawed and tried to get around it with all sorts of things, the history of the Labour Party. Party, poems, whatever else, but the reality is they support um, the Tory uh, welfare system, and that was just confirmed by Malcolm McMahon. They support welfare being held within the UK. You, yes, absolutely, because you would rather you would rather have the Tories dismantling the system than have a system here in Scotland supported by the, and meeting the needs of the people of Scotland. But speaker after speaker has talked this afternoon about the failed, failed welfare state, which is clearly no longer meeting the needs of our most vulnerable citizens. And we all see examples of that every day. And I see a UK government bringing measures that have little or no support in Scotland, and which, as Alison Johnson described, we're powerless to stop. In this Scottish Government, we don't have the power. This Scottish Government, of course, will always do what we can to mitigate the worst of these reforms. And Jamie Hepburn outlined a number of the issues we've taken. We've got a strong record in taking action and have backed this up with as much funding as we can muster from the constraints of a devolved block grant. But mitigation is simply softening the blows of Westminster. Well, that's not enough for me, and our people deserve more than that. This government, the Scottish government, ambition for Scotland is much, much higher. We have an ambition for Scotland. <coughs> Presiding officer, this government has set out a clear vision of welfare and an independent Scotland. We'll halt the rollout of the discredited universal credit. We'll replace personal independence payments with a benefit that ensures that people with a disability are treated with dignity and respect. We'll abolish the bedroom tax, we'll increase carers' allowance, and we'll increase benefits and, and minimum wage in line with inflation. Because as the first Deputy First Minister said in her opening remarks, Scotland is a wealthy country. Currently, social protection expenditure as a percentage of GDP is lower in Scotland than the rest of the UK, and it's still low compared to the EU. So we can afford to do things differently. The Scottish Government's vision of social security and an independent Scotland is one where we all contribute, just as we all receive help and support throughout our lives from the welfare state. But we also recognise we have a role in supporting and sustaining that system for future generations. And through devolution, it was mentioned by, I think, again, Jamie Hep uh, no, John Mason, Scotland has responsibility for education and skills, but not for employment, tax or welfare policies. And the majority of the people of Scotland want the Scottish Parliament to have control of welfare. And all of these are crucial to supporting people into sustained employment. And I think we all agree in that, that sustained employment is the route out of poverty. And we make clear in Scotland's future that where people can work, they should work. And in any case, we believe that the vast majority of people want to work. And the expert working group came to the same conclusions because it's important for people's well-being just as much as it's important for their prosperity. We also heard today about the increase of in-work poverty, that the equation of work uh, is a route out of poverty is not always true. And that's why we support measures like the Scottish Government's social wage and the living wage, which will make a real difference to the people of Scotland. It's why we're leading by example in ensuring that all the staff covered by the public sector pay policy are paid the Scottish living wage. And for those, for whatever reason, who can't work, they should be helped to lead rich, fulfilling lives. Our call that dignity and respect must be maintained is in direct contrast to the UK Government and now clearly to the Labour Party. Their approach, shown through measures such as the current sanctions policy, does little for people's self-respect and self-esteem. And these policies do little to provide people with the support they need. And Scottish Government research has shown that the most disadvantaged are particularly vulnerable to being sanctioned. I'll take an intervention. Michael McMahon. To recognise that the research conducted on behalf of the Welfare Reform Committee showed that the same problems existed right across England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Why do you want to abandon them to that fate in order to just pursue your own issues in Scotland?
Minister. This argument. This is a ridiculous yes. argument. We recognise that the policies are not helping people across the UK, we but we want to do here. something about it here yeah. in Scotland. Yeah, yeah. And we have an opportunity to do that on the 18th of September. And we are going to... Do, I mean, and raise your standards, raise your ambition. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. We'll all go down together. No, let us lead by example and help the rest of the UK at the same time. Let's lead by example. Yeah, yeah. What happened to the Labour Party? What happened to the Labour Party? I know. I, I've got. I, I have no idea what, what where the Labour Party are coming from just now, and I think it is really yeah. a, a where they're going. I think, as the Deputy First Minister has just said, I think it's an absolute nonsense the argument they're putting forward just now. And you know, the most worrying thing about this is that these cuts are still coming. There's more cuts still to yeah. come. We've heard today about 100,000 disabled people could lose up between £1,000 and £3,000 of a year uh, due to the change from DLA to PIP. Again, no response from the Labour Party in that. No. They're simply tied into the uh, Tory with their Tory, uh, Tory allies in this one. Yeah. No, we were asked, Jackie Bailey has been asked on several occasions, several will the Labour Party reverse the PIP changes and we have had no answer and that's because the answer is no. Um, but we have to remember something, that Labour has actually signed up with our Tory Liberal pals to this. They have signed up to continued austerity. They have signed up to continuous austerity. They have signed up to universal credit. They have signed up to the UK welfare reforms that will put 100,000 more children into poverty and 100,000 more disabled people into poverty. Jackie Bale is not shaking her head and saying this is nonsense. You've had the opportunity today to tell the people of Scotland what Labour are going to do about this and you have Nothing. not told us. So, <laughs> presiding officer, the issues around benefits and welfare reform for me crystallise the choice, the clear choice we have to make in September. And this is the choice between a future where some of the most important decisions about our country are made in Westminster by governments, whether it be Tory or Labour governments, that more often in Tory case are not elected in Scotland, yeah. or a future where the people of Scotland have the power to determine our own course and the responsibility for making the most of our extraordinary potential. And that is what independence is about. It's about making that choice for the benefit of the people of Scotland. It's about grasping that when we have an opportunity yeah. to make things better. We're all agreed it's not working the welfare system. We're putting forward proposals to make it better, a real change yeah. for the people of Scotland. And Labour can't accept that. They'd rather stick with their Tory alliance. You need to so wind up, Minister. I'm going to wind up. So we're looking the only way to get a welfare social security system that's fair, treats people with dignity and respect and meets the middle of needs of the people of Scotland is to vote yes on the 18th of September. That concludes the debate on welfare. We now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 10779 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 10779. Moved. No members asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is, the motion number 10779, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yeah. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of a Parliamentary Bureau motion. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 10780 on approval of an SSI. Moved. Question, this motion will be put at decision time, to which we now come. <coughs> There are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 10777.4 in the name of Jackie Bailey, which seeks to amend motion number 10777 in the name of Nicola Sturgeon on welfare be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cancel votes now.
The result of the vote on amendment number 10777.4 in the name of Jackie Bailey is as follows. Yes, 27. No, 82. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is amendment number 10777.2 in the name of Alex Johnson, which seeks to amend motion number 10777 in the name of Nicholas Surgeon on welfare be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cancel votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 10777.2 in the name of Alex Johnson is as follows. Yes, 17. No, 92. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10777 in the name of Nicola Sturgeon on welfare be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. Therefore, we move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 10777 in the name of Nicola Sturgeon is as follows. Yes, 65. No, 44. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10780 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of an SSI be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.